Although they did start working with the Beals revolver in the year of 1856, it would not be the same as what you think of the Remington New Model Army today. And if you're like me, you're into the history stuff, uh, the books, you like the guns are worth their weight. Because uh, again, it's fun to shoot, it's fun to point with, but without the story there, uh, if you're a history person like I am, without the story, it really doesn't mean all that. Ruger Security 9. Can I redraw? You already looked? No. <laughs> you sure right. you did? <laughs> now on three. Another pro, at least a pro to me, is these guns are kind of a project. I like to look at them as I'm getting an advanced kit build in the mail whenever I get one. So it's a project that you can go down the road and you can either leave it as Most people believe that the Walker was Colt's first extent to a very, very large pistol, but it wasn't. This was. This is Colt's 1839 to patent firearms revolving carbine pistol. It is massive. and we're back and i have not done this in a while so you might have to bear with me here but uh welcome to the reload show and tonight uh i'll kind of let him introduce himself down whoop, 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 down there, nope, nope. Oh, got right there yep. 311 yeah so i'll let you introduce yourself and uh kind of let you uh let everybody know what we're going to talk about tonight and go All ahead right. awesome you hear me everything's good mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, excited to be here. Happy to talk about muskets. Uh, I'm a work in progress, so I'm sure I'm going to say something and I'll be looking back at this uh, a year from now and be very uh, cringing at that. Uh, it's all part of the learning process. I just, happens, I'm indeed. Yeah. <laughs> happens to all of us. As a matter of fact, it, there's so many videos from my past that I just wish to uh, delete <laughs> and completely remake again. So, yeah, no worries, man. It's it's that's normal. It's common. Ethan said he put a disclaimer in, and that was a great idea, and I've gone and done that as well. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, about me, lifelong history, military history nerd. Uh, I'm sure we all have that in common. Former Marine infantryman, Revolutionary War reenactor. I've been collecting for about 10 years, but I've only, I'm pretty new to the flintlock and historical arms, only about three years at the moment. But, yeah, and uh, we're going to be talking about musket diplomacy, French arms, and the American War of Independence. So, Indeed. Exciting. Yeah, I can talk about that. The one that got us all here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if you guys got any questions in here about French muskets, this might be the night to ask them because uh, I'm going to be honest. I have a feeling Revero 311 down there knows quite a bit more than I do on these. I've had to go. I'll admit, I spent... Uh, what was it? I spent the better part of a couple months on orders earlier this year. And I spent, I had a lot of downtime and I spent a lot of that time watching your videos. And I was like, Ooh, mm, yeah, I need to fix that. And then I go back and watch my old videos. I was like, ah, this is rough. We're putting yeah. a disclaimer on everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> hey, you got the, uh, the, the mystery musket that I thought was a model nine. So, I don't, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, so I looked into that. And it really is an AN9. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's just, I think, and I'm not 100% sure, but I am, I'd say it's, I'm 99% sure just reading from what Bianchi says, mainly, that that's a Belgian made AN9. I mean, it's still an AN9, still would have been used by the French military. But 
Yeah, there was a lot of people. That's not a that's not an A and nine. I was like, hey, it really is. It really is. Well, before we get too far, let's go through the, the list of people here. Say hi to everybody in the chat. Okay. So let's see. Hunter Savage. Oh, I am too excited as well. <laughs> let's see. Carrie Sotomayor. San Diego standing by. Ooh, we got ourselves a Southern California. I was gonna say ninety <laughs> some about palm trees or something down there. Anyhow, <laughs> Texas, eighteen thirty-six. Oh, nice. Let's see. Ooh, you were at San Jacinto for the hundred and eighty-eighth anniversary. Now that sounds fun. I miss Texas. You know, I grew up there, and I spent my entire time as a young man leave, trying to leave that place. And once I left it, I spent my entire life trying to go back. Texas is the closest to heaven you can get. I believe it personally. I just spend most of my time when I'm in Texas and El Paso, so. Hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. One question from uh, Texas1836 is hoping to get some footage to kick off his channel. Any advice? Well, if you don't mind, I can, I'll go first. If that's cool with you, Ethan. Yeah. Um, the best advice I can tell you is do your best on every video you, you can. Don't short anything. Put as much time in as you can. Say I'm going to spend X amount of time on the video. Even if I'm done before that, then we'll try to cut up edits and make it better. And then every time you release another video, try to make it better than the next. And at the same time, watch other channels who are successful. Look at the way they edit. Look at the way they incorporate music. Uh, look at the way their you know, shots, like different shots are filmed and take that as a, uh, a way of doing it as well. Um, it, you're not per se stealing their stuff, but what I'm saying is look at it and take it as a tool to use yourself on any other kind of filming or storytelling you want to try to create. Cause if you notice, you go to the really top channels, they all seem very similar on just high end quality in the way they film, the way they do stuff. And that's because that's kind of what people have a standard for today. If you see that standard, try to live up to that standard. And it really makes a big difference. It really does, especially the editing and taking the time and good audio. Audio is more important than you'd believe. Um, you can actually watch a video that the video quality is not so good, but if the audio quality sucks, most people won't even watch the video. Even if it's perfect video quality. To be quite honest, when you're doing videos like we do, which are kind of like uh, informational videos, historical, you know, whatever, most people actually listen to those videos more than actually watch them, if you notice. You just put your headphones in, going down the road mm -hmm. or something, you listen to it. But yeah, I see what you're saying about the audio there. I still need to find my lapel mic. <laughs> yeah, my, trust me, me too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyhow. But yeah, I, I really think that is the key to success. And um, don't do it for money because yep. you're going to be shortchanged more than you believe. <laughs> Just do it because you like doing it. Um, yep. If you somehow the worlds collide and you know the universe throws you that favor and you hit that out of the park, and you're just like one of the best YouTubers ever, then, you know, yay, that's great. That's awesome. Love to see one of our community do that. Just don't expect it at first, especially at first. The first thousand subs are the hardest. I mean, it is the hardest. That's what I but, think it took us. Uh, yeah, it took us two years to get to a thousand subscribers. So no, like two and a half, almost three, I think for me, if I remember right, it's been, a, it's been a while. It's slow. But yeah, it's slow. But once you get past that, it's, if you put the effort in once you're past a thousand, it's a little bit easier. It seems to be a little bit easier to to grow from there. And but, even yeah. like you were talking about Snapper, uh, um, taking ideas for good footage. Sometimes I'll watch a movie, and there'll be a scene that'll stick with me. And there's one that I can think of, and it, and I'm gonna try a little spoiler alert for my next Independence Day video, which is, by the way, surprise going to be on French muskets in the American Revolution, Guns of Revolution. Uh, oh, that's my it. shock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my shock. But it's like I've had this, and I did it a little bit with the Brown Best video in the intro. Uh, there's that scene from uh, Patriot, uh, the farm scene, where you got the dusk, and it's kind of you know gloomy. You got a little bit of smoke hanging there, and then all of a sudden you can just see the flashes of those flintlocks going off in the background. That paired with some footage of the uh, Waterloo uh, reenactment they did here a few years ago where you can actually see the volley go off in the distance and then you just hear that thunder, you know, from a mile away, like two or three seconds later. 
that may or may not be playing a part in the next Independence Day video. I think I'm going to have about a 30-man volley, attempt to have a 30-man volley <laughs> off in the distance. That would be cool. That would be yeah. real cool. Uh, anyhow, uh, I'm going to go to the next one here. Diane mm -hmm. Houston, good evening all. I have to. The reason I bring up Diane Houston is I had to let her know I have got her lock almost all ready to go. I've just got a. I did a little work on a Northwest trade gun lock for her, and uh, I'm just going to. I got some polishing and I've got a case hardened, two more parts on it, and it's ready to go. Uh, but it's that thing is a that thing is a um, flamethrower for a lock. I was surprised at how much spark that thing threw. So, yeah. nice. I'll Let's see the next snapper. Read the next comment. Louisiana Gray, hey buddy, this is one of our. Uh, I would say like one of my favorite people always in the chat. Really cool guy. Louisiana Gray. You're awesome, buddy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ah, smoke in the woods. I don't know who that guy is. Uh, I've never heard of him before. <laughs> Kerry so Sotomayor? Is that, am I saying that right? Do what? If I mispronounce it, I went to public school. Me fell English, me not know why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then there's Garrett. Yeah. I miss Garrett already. Let's see. Creek, creek. All things black powder. Brock McLaughlin. Brandon Birch. Uh, thank you guys for coming in. Let's see. Let's see. Desert Rat 45. Hey. So my do, 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 do. Turkey Creek. Malcolm G. Antique Gunslinger. Josh Mc Gaskin. Gaskin. Sorry, like I said, I'm I went to public school, guys. Come on. <laughs> Malcolm G. Hardy. Hey, Hardy. Uh, David W. And Carrie Sotomayor again. I hope I didn't pronounce, like, slay those names too bad. Stottermeyer. <laughs> hey, there's and then Jake. there's Jake. Howdy, Jake. <laughs> I got a video coming up about French powder eventually once I actually get around to making it. I just got all my ingredients in, and I just got to get some time to actually make the powder. So that's something else to look up or – to look forward to all right i think we're caught up snapper i think so are there any questions before we start our little get to go um just before we start the history lesson for today like i said guys any questions on french muskets or firearms in general in the american revolutionary war tonight is probably the night to ask so, without further ado, I may get this thing started off by asking my yeah. question. I got to think of one right quick. Hmm. Oh, no. uh -oh. This is not even prepped. <laughs> this isn't even prepped. <laughs> oh, no. So, you went to, so you went to uh, Guilford, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, I had heard uh, there's a museum there, correct? Yep. I think. Amazing. Yep. I heard, that there, I heard there's a 1717 french musket on display at that museum that was used at guilliford so they have a, a 1766 slash 68 i actually have pictures from it um they have three muskets they have one german one french one english okay uh i didn't see a 1717 in that case but i can go relook through my pictures because the uh i think that Amer the French musket actually had the IP, the Joseph Perkins um, mm -hmm. initials on the stock. Yeah. So that's what kind of threw it off. And then also leading up to and before Guilford, 4,000 French muskets were sent from the Philadelphia Supply Agency to um, refit the Southern Army. Mm -hmm. uh, they say that happened before and after. They do have uh, a bunch. Of, they have the musket. They're pretty sure. They have a musket they said they picked off, off the battlefield. I don't remember 1717, but it could be there. There's yeah. a great museum. I just great. saw, yeah, I can't even remember where I'd heard that from. I don't know if it was one of my commenters or something, or but somebody had mentioned 1717s being used in the revolution. And they were like, well, there's one at the museum at Guilford. And uh, I was like, oh, I always kind of thought about that. But yeah, I wasn't 100% sure. That's why I kind of asked. Uh well, I mean, but 1717 by 1770s, 1780s, that's pretty old. <laughs> yeah, so I actually have a note on this. Decius Wadsworth was a captain of ordnance, and he writes in 1814, the oldest pattern of French musket, which I can find an account of, was a 1746. 
a change that was made in 1754, another change that took place in 1763. And this is mm -hmm. what's interesting. So you got uh, the 60, another, 63, yes. 54, and the 46. And the 46, which I think the only difference really between the 46, if I remember right, and the 28 is longer. Yeah, 46 was the first one that they put the MLE PAP model on the Tang. And then the 46, another difference was they had lengthened out the flats on the side of the barrel. Okay. Um, and I think other than that, it's basically a 28, if I remember right. And I think it has an iron rammer is another difference between the regular 28. Sorry. I just, uh, that, I that had to shoot that rabbit before I, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about Charlottesville, right? And, how, and then he says they, the, the improvements adopted in 1766, 68. 70, 71, 73. So I'm like, 68, what? That's not supposed to be a thing. <laughs> yeah. And this was the, he was a captain of ordnance. Uh, he's the one that uh, talks about, the, it was the known, the 1763 known commonly as a Charleville. And then it says, from this statement, the terminology Charleville pattern was born and continued in use until the American Standard Musket of 1815. And it says, because Wadsworth was a veteran in the field ordinance, his comments come into a certain expertise amongst arms holders. And that comes from U.S. Military Flintlocks by Schmidt. Still need to get so, that book. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I really need to get that book before July, especially. Uh, interesting. So, yeah, and I've also got, I don't know if you got that, uh, the, um, wow, now I can't even remember the name of it. I'd was reading through it for that colonial troop musket. The uh, what was it? French Army think... Colonial America. Yes, yes, that yeah. one. Yeah, that's per that was actually a pretty good one. I was really surprised whenever I opened that up and just found out. I think there's about a page and a half worth of information on that 1779. I talked to my historian friend that works at the museum, and when you did the at, you're like, "Hey, Revere, what gun is this?" I'm nothing without my books and sources. I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, I'm my here. phone." And this is how I got into this is because online information is so garbage. Yeah, <laughs> like, it is. The Smithsonian has the, the the labeling wrong. You can't trust an auction house. You don't know what yeah. you're looking at. You speaking about making money. You can't, the amount of money I spend in books. <laughs> yeah. <just to> <laughs> You know, what's funny is you, you talk to people like 10 years ago, they would have said books are dead. Like nobody's yeah, buying no. books anymore. Now it's the only place you can go to find good, trustworthy information. You, you can't find it on the internet. Everything is opinion and just tribal knowledge. Nothing oh, yeah. is, is 100%. It's, it's quite bad, actually. It, it's really bad. Um, yeah. And that's just all across the board. Not just, you know, your guys is there. The era I like, yeah, it's just everything. Yep. Is it like that. Hey, R. L. Wilson. There. Go ahead. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you a rant about my most favorite person. I'd always love to have stabbed. R. L. Wilson. <laughs> oh God, that man. He ruined everything. I hate that guy a lot. <laughs> There's a certain place in hell for him. <laughs> if you ever read Dante's Inferno, there's like a Pope tube. They would shove the, the Pope's in. That, that's exactly where I hope R. L. Wilson ends up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, R.L. Wilson was a little shady and uh, kind of ruined a lot yeah. of information. He stole from the greatest cult museum there was. So the, some of the best, the most, rarest guns in the world. And he would take them, uh, he would sell them, right? He would, he'd grab a gun, work with one of the people that's there to, and then he would come up with a story behind the gun that isn't real to sell it at a higher hype so he would get more commission on it. And he would take even more commission than he was allowed to. Or he would take guns that were so rare and they shouldn't be leaving the museum. He would sell those, saying that they were duplicates. Um, instead of the actual duplicates, he would sell the original, like very first kind of thing. And uh, he also had several guns that he had taken from the museum that were like very, very rare. Like one or two of only. And then they would be sent to a gun, uh, gun shop and it'd be gone for three or four months. And then he realized the gun shop they went to, they actually specialized and making replicas, like making a gun perfect to a replica. So they don't even know if they have the original gun back. <laughs> so yeah, and it'd be found in these places. So they're not sure is this the actual original gun we have here in the museum, or is it a really, really good replica? Because these people were over the top. I mean, they were, they were doing everything the same way they used to. 
So it wasn't like, hey, yeah, you could just look at the metal. metal. I mean, you could technically, I guess, but they would use like wrought iron when they'd make something. So it's not as easy to, to separate it and try to figure it out modern day wise without spending a lot crap ton of money, especially back when this all happened. This was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, well, it started in the 70s, 70s, 80s ish. And it kind of started falling apart by the 90s. But yeah, he still didn't get in any major trouble. The guy supposedly went to jail, but for very, very little time. And, you know, yeah, it, it was a shame. He, he ripped off and rewrote history. And so much of the history on especially Colt, because that's what I love the most, Colt, is wrong. And it's mostly because of him. A lot of the stuff you hear about modern cults, it, it's wrong. And it's 90% because of him. And it's sad. Yeah, so... But... To make a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, Snapper doesn't like R.L. Wilson. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> don't say. Uh, yeah. Neither do I, I'm I, a man. nice guy, but he pushed, he pushed me too far, okay? <laughs> I, always, I always get a chuckle of that. Okay, we got a question here. Uh... And I'm going to let Rivero311 answer this one. Oh, man. Hardy has a question. What was the most common long arm in use during the revolution that people don't usually think of now? And then later on, he uh, somebody had asked him uh, what side. Yeah, Stottlemyre had asked him what side. He said, uh, any side, I guess, maybe on the colonial side. So basically, what was the most underrated firearm that was used a lot? The Fowler. The Fowler is the the original American gun. Everyone thinks it's a pin fastened English gun or it's a, a French musket. Those are those exist and they exist in large quantities. But I love hearing about the Fowlers because when I first heard a Fowler and I see them like uh, out, I'm like, what is this? Like, what is different between this and a musket? It's basically just a lightened musket with no bayonet lug. Yep. So it's going to have smaller parts. And uh, amazingly enough, they come up for auction very commonly. And you can get a 1750s Fowler and they, they'll have them under $1,000. Mm -hmm. But the, the Fowlers mm -hmm. were used extensively, especially in the beginning of the war, because there was no, it was just the militia acts that were in place were bring a strong firelock. There was no bring a gun of this caliber. It was just bring a strong firelock. Bring, bring lead, <laughs> bring powder, and you can make your rounds to fit your individual barrels when needed. So the yeah. Fowler. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. And that is that is the American way. I mean, yeah. look at the, the, the common hunting rifle, basically, is what they fought. Yeah. Yes. So uh, speaking of which, uh, I was looking on online auction sites like I do now a lot for originals. Thank you, <laughs> Rivera 311. <laughs> and... Uh, I went and I uh, actually found a original fusil de chasse, and it was an old one. It was an early one, and it had a bayonet lug fitted to it. So I was like, "Hmm, there's you. There's you a pretty cool Fowler that's been modern or modified for military service." Uh, but going back to that question, uh, so as far as the most common long arm in use, especially on the colonial side, and I kind of say it's. It's not so bad now, but about 10 years ago, I would definitely say it was one of the most underrated was definitely the Charleville or the 1766, because everybody you could ask what they use in the Revolutionary War, everybody would say two things, the Brown Bass and the Kentucky Long Rifle to people who had just skimmed over, you know, Revolutionary War history. That was the two guns that everybody always said it was. And what is it now? Uh, I think it was, they said somewhere anywhere between 100 and 110,000. Uh, yep. Just uh, the 1766 model got imported. Uh, so that would have been on the American side. British side, I'm not as well read up on, but I think it's, were there more, I think there was more short land patterns later on in the war, but I know there was a lot of long land patterns early on, wasn't there? Yeah, I think it's mostly long land from yeah. off the top of my head. Um, Jim Gallagher, he's a historian over at the the museum in Yorktown. He states that the short, the second models don't really come until Saratoga. So that is the summer of 77. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's pretty late. But there, you do see a lot of restocked long, restocked in American walnut long lands. But yeah. You know, that, you that, mentioned. That, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that's all I had. Well, you mentioned restocking, 
And that reminds me of another thing I saw on an auction site. Thank you, Ruby 311. <laughs> <laughs> and it was being sold as a Pennsylvania Fowler. This was the only Fowler that I've ever seen that had barrel bands and hmm. an iron ramrod and Charleville written on the lock. <laughs> it was a it was a, definitely a 66 Charleville that had been restocked in tiger stripe maple and it was I, it was original. Like they had pictures of all the markings and everything but you could tell they just restocked it in uh tiger stripe which looked pretty looked a little weird but it was kind of cool at the same time. Did it have I, like, I think I sent you a picture of that, didn't I? I it was either Probably. you or Madras Arsenal. They only sold for like twelve hundred bucks. Oh man, it's kind of ridiculous. Did it have a? It's actually not about that? price. Oh, and it had U.S. stamped on the uh, lock plate, if uh, I remember right. It sold for how much? Like twelve hundred bucks. And it had U.S. stamp. Wow, someone yeah, got away. and if I had have hmm. spent all of my allowance on an A and nine. <laughs> No, no, the seventeen seventy nine. I'd spent it. Yeah, I'd spent my allowance on the seventeen seventy nine. And I saw that pop up, and I was like, ah, yikes! But oh, that's well. a I'll, beautiful piece, though. Yes, I'll get one one of these days. Uh, let's see here. Uh, whoop, whoop! Snappers blinking in and out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we have uh, quite a bit of wind here, so if you guys hear any weird noises, there's a set of French doors next to me, to our back door patio, and that thing is just going crazy. Yeah. So, so here's here's a question for you, Rivero 311, and I kind of have an opinion on this one. But um, and Hardy brings it up. He says, or not Hardy, uh, Kerry Stottlemyre says, I'm gonna guess and say the locally built long rifle or a French made musket, a 1766 or a 1777 A9. But he's like, I don't know, Jack. Uh, so that brings up the question: Were there any Americans using 1777s? <laughs> No, I have not. I have not seen any any proof of 1777s. The French had them at yep. Yorktown. I've never seen that confirmed. That's just kind of general knowledge I've picked up. And there and was like see. only what 400, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah. Readout number nine. I think. Uh, readout number nine. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, readout nine and ten. There were there were more French uh, soldiers, Marines there than Continentals. Yeah, which I I actually found interesting because that uh I mean obviously that 1779 it's stamped 1786 on the stock which would have been last year production for that model. But um they Marines, did export they exported them. They exported them after 1785. Yeah, Just, and you um, Yeah, I sent you, you that. Yeah. Yeah, you found some pretty interesting information on that gun after I made that video. Uh I found pretty interesting. Um I have to go back and find it. With that uh, being said, if anyone does find proof that a 77 was used, I will happily change my mind. I just yes. haven't seen it. Uh, some online auctions are going to sell you a, a load yep. of goods and tell you that 77s <laughs> were used, but I've never seen it. And if you, none of the books say it. Yep. <laughs> That's, yeah. That's, yeah, it's every single book I've read on the subject, they all kind of are in agreement that the 1777 was really only in use by the french troops um but, so it's it's yeah. possible just not probable yeah. is that what we're saying here yeah it's uh just highly unlikely it's about as possible as seen i don't know i don't know yeah it, it's not very bigfoot so you're saying there's a chance <laughs> you're saying there's a chance hey my think. video yeah. I'm trying to think of some foreign made rifle that was made during the civil war that somebody tries to sell on gun broker and it was 100% not used in the civil war, but they're like civil war era. And then the guy civil war it, era like, trapdoor Springfield civil war era trapdoor Springfield. This is my 1865 58 rimfire trapdoor first Allen conversion that was used at Gettysburg. <laughs> used at Gettysburg. <laughs> this is yep. Yeah. I have a model 1803 Harper's Ferry and, uh, I don't. I haven't made the video because there's a whole argument if Lewis and Clark took 1803s with them. Oh, I need Garrett here for that one. Actually, we got the guy to ask in the comment section here. Turkey oh Creek, yeah, Turkey Creek well, 1823. Mm. Well, this is good because I need to know this before I make a video about because it. Before we I also have it. an we also have an 1803 Harper's Ferry that we need to make a video on. 
and I just I've been really busy here lately. Uh, but yeah, Turkey Creek 1823 actually built the one that we have, and it is spot on. Nice. Um, oh, Garrett says to ask you about your Winchester musket. I showed him that video this morning. He went. <laughs> yeah, so I went in to a gun show, and I, as soon as I walk in, it's all guns I'm not interested in. And then I see this Winchester musket. I'm like, will you trade for this? And he's just like, what do you got? And I'm like, I got a Rockola M1 carbine. I got an Eli Whitney 1841, and I have a Moss 36. He's like, I'll do that. I was like, all right. I know nothing about Winchesters. And uh, so I have it. I Where'd made you get the bayonet from the bayonet came with it. So, yeah, that's interesting. It's yeah, it, you'll it's, have to look at the short snapper. It is long. I, I need to see this. Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. It's on my one of my shorts. Yeah, it's a uh, I'll and it's one of those things. There's, I don't have any books on it. Uh, so I have before I can't make a video. <laughs> so my video would be five seconds long. It'd be like it's a musket. It's called a musket. The terminology has it called a musket, but it's not really a musket. And then I had somebody, we went down a rabbit hole. It's like, it's not really a musket. I was like, well, it's just kind of phrasing. It's called a musket. <laughs> yeah. Like the it, so I'm guessing, guessing it is not a muzzle loader being no, a Winchester. It's, it's, it's a lever action. It is what uh, year is oh, it? Are we talking, it's like a lever action, but it, it it's a long rifle, like long rifle. Got okay, on. I know what you're talking about. I've heard of people. Yeah, I've heard of people calling those muskets before. I mean, it's in the name. It is. It's yeah, in the name. Musket. Yeah. Um. Let's see here. I'm sitting there going Winchester. Like that's a little late for <laughs> a muzzle loading. It's like a little late. I don't know what they were doing. I, did they have a time machine or something? <laughs> like what did they yeah. do? I can't laugh uh, and look, like not laugh and look at it. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Yeah, those are my favorite kind of guns. The ridiculous Turkey, ones. Turkey Creek says you are dead on Revere 0311 about the civilian smoothbore. Um, yeah, I'd have to agree. That's that's another thing I always I always think is funny is when you talk about the American uh, militia troops, what they were armed with in the Revolution. Most people say they were armed with a rifle. And I'm like, yeah, there was rifles, but not as many as you think. <laughs> yeah. There's like this, there's like this picture that's been painted of the American Revolution where every single American soldier is fighting from the trees with a long rifle. And I'm like, Yeah, Kentucky yeah. long rifle. Yeah. No, sure. the infantry <laughs> yep. won the, it was the light infantry that took out Readout 10. It's the infantry, yeah. man. It's a slug fest. Yep. It's your average grunt out there in line, loving life, exchanging yep. blows. Oh my God! It's what I like, wouldn't want to be anywhere else either. One of the first references I hear about uh, actual rifles being used in North America was from Dewitt Bailey's book. Uh, I got because of British muzzleloaders, the YouTube channel. Uh, Dewitt Bailey's book on the. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a terrible time with these names. I think it's the British, the British flintlock rifle from. Yeah, I can't remember the the dates on it, but anyhow, there's a story in the beginning of there of a. A soldier at Braddock's defeat at the Monongahela, and he's talking about he could tell the difference between being shot at by the natives with the smooth bores because he said you just hear you know the loud boom. He said, and then every now and then he'd say you'd hear a um, uh, a whizzing through the air. He said it sounded like ripping paper, and he said those were those those spun up uh, rifles. <laughs> The spinning um, of the bullets make the noise. Yeah. And I think they, DeWitt Bailey had mentioned in that book that he's like, that was really kind of like the first mention of rifles being used in North America in combat. Um, that is a crazy thing to think of right now. There's three infantrymen talking about history. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that, that is not right. I mean, there's something wrong here. The knuckles raggers should not be doing this. <laughs> we need a bunch of SOCOM guys trying to motivate yeah. you and telling you to go. Yeah. And yeah. somebody needs to be yelling at you to read more yeah, no, while you're no. doing push-ups while you're talking about history. It's Here, people... put that, put that pencil in your mouth and go to the front lane and rest and write me a position right and write, write it out. Without yeah. Moving your head. <laughs> no. Um, let's see here. I had some questions here. Oh, Jay Wheeler, uh, asks, Hey Jay. Yeah. Uh, he says, as long as I, he's like, so here's a question. So as long as I have known Snapper, I've never asked, how did you get the name Snapper? 
Oh, well, it's a very interesting story. Next. <laughs> oh, okay. No, really, it's, believe it or not, I, I used to have my regular name there. And anybody who's ever been knows me. I actually like turtles a lot, especially snapping turtles. I love the guys. They're the greatest. They're the coolest little turtles ever. They're like dogs, but way smarter. <laughs> no joke. Like a snapping turtle can be incredibly smart. You could yeah. teach it to fetch. You could do all kinds of crazy things with a snap turtle. The and is, they're also big and scary and mean yeah. if they want to be. But they're also the biggest babies in the world. They remind me of like Rockweilers. Well, you know where uh, alligator snappers. Oh yeah, I like those too. Those are actually the big dinosaur alligator yeah. snappers. They're actually they're not as smart, but they are. They're very like stoic creatures, man. They are. They're they're cool. They're cool in their own way. I love them too. I'd love to have one. So getting um, off, but I just I just put my name like just the wild snapper just once because I couldn't th think of any name at all instead of my regular name. So I was watching a lot of snapping turtle videos. Okay, all right. And I mean that's it. That's it. Just snapping turtles. Get and uh, yeah, I just kept it and I never changed it. I was like, you know what? Oh, I'll take you from snapper. I'll just keep snapper. And yeah, I kind of like the nickname. It kind of fits, I guess. I know it's off subject of what we're going to talk about, but you know, you're talking about how smart snappers are. I was impressed. Thank you. I, I thank you. I, I think I am too. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Snapping turtles. <laughs> I was impressed on whenever the ponds all started drying out around here last summer. I think I sent you some of the videos, Snapper, of this convoy of snapping turtles going down the road oh, yeah. to the river like four miles away. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty smart. They actually know where that thing is. Uh, oh, no, they're, they're incredible animals. As a matter of fact, if you, if you raise one as a baby and you're really nice to it and it never has any reason to really fear you, mm -hmm. it is insane the amount of um, care and attention it will give to you as a person. Like I know a guy who has one and he treats it like a puppy dog and this this turtle doesn't like to sleep unless it's laying on his feet like this this thing acts just like a puppy dog i mean he gets home that turtle's going crazy just to see him everywhere he goes that turtle's right next to him like turtle is so upset every time he goes to work I and mean, it is it is the neatest thing imagine a puppy dog that really loves you and then switch that out with like a 50 pound dinosaur <laughs> dinosaur yeah basically <laughs> Um, yeah. And then, uh, and they're incredibly like, um, fierce, but yet very like protective of their owners as well. It, it's, it's really interesting because you wouldn't think a lizard basically is that smart, but man, they're incredible, incredible animals. So Revere 0311, tell us how you got your YouTube name. I know where the last part comes from. Right, yeah. It's got to be something about turtles, though. If there's really? not turtles, it's not a cool story. <laughs> I, no, I was in a. I played computer games. It's my gamer tag. So, <laughs> and 0311. I'm. I wonder, not a, Marine. Not an 0331. Not an 0331. 0311. Just that basic line just made it. <laughs> uh, yep. I had a 19 on my ACT, so I was going straight to the infantry. Really <laughs> I'm going to run JV cross country at a community college. It's like, nah, man, <laughs> I'm getting out of Iowa. Well, uh, oh. probably better than mine because I had gotten a – oh, I, I just got out of basic training, and they had given me that we had – we zeroed with irons, and then we zeroed with the CCO, and I'd rather zero with the irons. I hate the CCO, by the way. I, I never I got, could hit crap with it. And then I got to my unit and I got an ACOG. Mm. Mm. World changing. World changing. And I mentioned on some video, I can't remember what channel it was, how much I like the ACOG. And some guy got on there and was like, if you were actually in the Army, you'd know how terrible the ACOG was. And I was like, oh, oh okay. I'll just change my name to a little like bang, bang. Yeah, yeah. I was that guy straight out of basic training. But it's stuck. Hey, I don't care what anybody says. The ACOG is by far the single most deadliest thing they added to a rifle. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, ACOG, what? Everyone buys an ACOG. I've never met any. Exactly. Heck, I even buy ACOGs because I love them so much. And I'm happily, they, yeah, they're probably better optics these days. But I would still rather have an ACOG because you know why? I've never broken an ACOG. Yeah. I've seen guns completely torn apart, but the ACOG still worked fine. It's so, a so story about the ACOG. One night I was sitting, well, I wasn't sitting. I was up in a, a tower in Syria, pitch black, no light. Didn't have my nods on. And I'm just, you know, kind of strolling, yeah, strolling around with my in my flip-flops and my hoodie and 
I got my M4 and I'm walking around and I was talking to some fellas up in the tower and I go to walk out and I wasn't paying attention and I had my squad leader up there with me and I walk right off the edge of an eight foot Hesco <laughs> and I land smack on that M4 and right on that ACOG. And, just, and my, uh, my squad leader was Laotian and I was, it was hilarious because I just heard that Asian laugh over eight feet above me. I just heard, <laughs> And uh, I look up there, and we got to shoot the next morning to make sure I'm still zeroed. And that ACOG, even though it fell straight eight feet on top of that ACOG into the gravel, into the rocks, it still was zeroed. And I was sold after that. No, they're great. They're worth it. I actually posted a video shooting down the sights with my phone with one, and someone commented, that's not an ACOG. It's like, <laughs> and then he got me because I was just like, do I own an ACOG? And I know I own an ACOG. <laughs> I went over and looked at him like, yeah, it's an ACOG. Gotta make sure the letters are molded in there. <laughs> it's no, like, hey, I, I spent like a thousand dollars on this thing. It better be an ACOG. Yeah. My, uh, my, girlfriend, my girlfriend told me I don't have the personality to take criticism online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Most of us don't either until you've really? done it for a while. And then, believe it or not, it turns into a game. Yeah, yeah and you know, it's, it's totally like, oh, please, somebody, because it's I get to actually act the way I wish I could act all the time. But yeah, I've just I've just started posting my negative comments on yeah. Facebook, especially the ridiculous ones. I'll be like, and I've got a little subsection called "My comments are wild," yeah. and <laughs> I've got a paper cartridges has come on there, and he's like, "Yeah," he starts telling me some of his horror stories. <laughs> he's like, "Yeah, I can get pretty interesting." But anyhow, you love how somebody who doesn't know you will make yeah. assumptions on everything, and it, it it's usually like that's not like. For that, that's not an ACOG. That's like you do realize ACOG now makes different, like the the the, the reticles on the inside are now different. You can get them in like three or four different styles. Yep. Yeah. No, it's just funny because like I knew what it was, but he made me question myself, and it was just like no one has the amount of confidence as some random dude on on YouTube. Yeah, right? Also, like right? someone being like well, reenactor reenactors aren't real. Yeah. It's like of course. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah. that reminds me, I did an accuracy test with that, uh, with my 1766, 1766, yeah. you know, kind of out of the box. And one of the comments was, This test is invalid because there's nobody downrange shooting at you. This is fact. Yeah. And I was like, mm -hmm. Yes. So, all right. So, next time I go to do an accuracy test, I need to go get my little brother Caleb and go tell him to take his brown bass and go stand out there 50, 100 yards. And shoot at me while I'm doing this. And that'll make it more accurate. Uh, yeah. Somebody I, should tell that the army's uh like your your regular army accuracy tests. You know when you go qualify, right now, they don't count because nobody's shooting at you. <laughs> um, that was another one I got here recently. I actually made that short over. It was a guy got on there and he was like, "You guys don't know anything. You've got a uh, those aren't. That's not a safety on that Lehman rifle. Those are set triggers. That's it'll still go off if you pull that front trigger." And I was like, "Hmm." Funny, because I'm holding this very rifle in my hand right now. I've taken it apart. I've looked at this lock, and I guarantee you, it won't go off until you pull that back trigger. Uh, anyhow, going back to the subject, because Rivero 311, uh, he, he kind of prepared for this, and there were some more uh, comments, questions up here. Uh, let's see here. Where did the Revolution get most of their guns? I'm assuming the American colonial troops. This is from Matthew Bryce. He says, from the French, right? He says, new to this community. So, uh, long story short, the French do provide over 108,000 recorded shipments of uh, French infantry muskets and military arms. It might be as high as 250,000. I've heard that number thrown around. Some of those guns are lost at sea. Um, a majority, so you're going to have three things. You're going to have captures. Oh, see my finger. You're going to have captures from the, the royal government. You're going to have uh, like self-procured guns. Guns are made uh, committees um, in the state arsenals. And then you're going to have like you can also kind of refer to those as your militia muskets. And then you're going to have the French guns. So it's like three pillars, not one. Late, earlier in the war, you're going to have more English style pin muskets. Later in the war, you're going to have more French muskets. But we still have the British pattern style muskets all the way into the 1800s. And in the early 1800s, I found this piece of information amazing. They were they were doing contracts with the British in like 1800 to make them firearms in the whole Napoleonic Wars going on. But an interesting fact is that they had uh, the British land pattern muskets, the brown bests, and the Navy wanted them. 
because they wanted him because they were, they had the brass on it and they wanted to give him to the Marine Corps <sighs> because at sea all the muskets only last a year. Mm-hmm. So they mm-hmm. want so they had enough brown bre- enough brown besses, English muskets, yeah. whatever, <laughs> hanging out like <laughs> hanging out. So like there is a good selection. Uh, I yeah. So going kind of off of what you were talking about there about the Marines and the Navy preferring the brown best style lamp pattern or C pattern musket. Uh, I found it interesting. I got another one here recently, and I cannot hardly find any information on this gun. And the bit of information I did find, I kind of bet I was really skeptical of it, but I some of it I did prove true. And I've got a Lane and Reed uh, New England militia musket. And what's funny is it's like a baby land pattern musket in 69 caliber. And the source I had heard, and the one thing that does back this up is it does, in fact, have a Springfield barrel on it, is that hmm. the Boston Mili- or the Massachusetts militia had a, uh, they were preferential to the British pattern of musket. And this Lane and Reed company had taken a bunch of old, beat up 1795s in the 1830s. And then, you know, they had broken stocks or whatever, and they restocked them put a new lock on them with the 18 or 1795 or 1816 Springfield barrels. And they mm-hmm. built basically miniature land pattern muskets, which technically it'd be like a miniature uh, Indian pattern, India pattern musket. I, I need to, I need to do a video on it. It's, it's not working right now, but I, I do have it over there at the studio. Um, but yeah, uh, there were some more questions up here. Jay Wheeler had a pretty good one. Uh, yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. Yeah. What's y'all's favorite movie or show about the revolutionary, or uh, the American Revolution? Uh, I haven't really first. watched a long, long, a lot on it, but enjoy, Taryn. What's that? I, I love the Patriot. Yeah. Uh, yep, the, there you go. Oh, no. Yeah, that actually yeah, is a good movie. Off. I know it's a little... Idiot. That's going to get me canceled from the reenacting community. They're going to see that. But no, well, the Patriot, like just that scene of that nighttime dusk shootout. Yes. The punchiness. Oh, uh, the beginning. Guns. Yeah. It's a fun movie, guys. Yep. It's the only movie we're going to get about the South in the American Revolution. Just take it. Be happy with it. Like people are so hard on it. It's like you have one movie. Like, come on, yep. guys. But let's be honest. If they made it now, it would be worse. Yeah, yeah it, it was made look before CGI and, too. Yeah. And you know what's yeah. you know what's funny about that is, I, I get the Patriot gets a lot of things wrong. Yeah. But if you really look into it, aside from I can think of like a handful of things, the Battle of Calpens wasn't bad if you look at it as historical fiction. As in, there's definitely no guy named Benjamin Martin out there. Benjamin Martin is a, a conglomeration of Francis Marion, of believe it or not. Um, Jack Henson from the Civil War, uh, he's rolled into there a little bit, and Daniel Morgan. And uh, so it's, if you look at it as there's not a guy named Benjamin Martin out on the battlefield, because even uh, the things that they got wrong at Calpins, and I'm sure you can uh, name off a few more things than I can, but number one, Cornwallis wasn't there. Tarleton was in charge. Tarleton uh, Cornwall- doesn't die. What's that? Tarleton, Tarleton doesn't, doesn't die. die, yes. Or yeah, that there, there's you there's you too. But you also gotta, you know, like I say, you gotta watch it as historical fiction. But Tarleton, depending on the story, uh, I gotta remember there's a story of Tarleton actually being involved in a duel with one of Washington's rel- relatives after Lillian the battle. Washington, right? Colonel Washington. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they face off so, again at Guilford. Guilford. There's that. And also, uh, if you replace the name Benjamin Martin with Daniel Morgan, uh, one of the things I saw that was wrong there was um, they show, and it's a little thing, it's kind of a nitpicky thing, is they show uh, the American troops as the British are coming over the hill. They show them uh, harassing them basically with artillery, where in reality, if you were going to use Benjamin Martin as Daniel Morgan, you would have had him with his riflemen out there skirmishing uh, out on the field, and then falling back, falling back, falling back. Um, but other than that, like I said, Tarleton didn't die. Cornwallis wasn't there. The artillery and Daniel Morgan skirmishing. 
it's really pretty spot on. So Tarleton, um, Tarleton gets captured at uh, Yorktown, and he was worried they were going to hang him. Like he was, yeah. From what I remember, it's a good story, so I'm going to tell it. So like Tarleton's like, because he's across the river from Yorktown, and they surrender, and he's like, I don't know what's going to happen here. Waxhaw started started start thinking about Waxhaw massacre. Yeah, he started thinking about. <laughs> hey, he got knocked off his horse. He lost control for those five seconds. That got all yeah. the Virginians killed. But yeah, that's uh. See, if they would have used Arthur Morgan instead of Daniel Morgan, it would have been a much better movie. I actually named my kid Daniel Morgan. Oh, did you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love the story of Daniel Morgan. He's like one of the, I would have to say, if there was an unsung hero of the American War of Independence, it would probably have to be Daniel Morgan. Yeah. Uh, and just that story of the uh, the whipping he got. And then at the surrender, hey, go tell your king he still owes me one lash. <laughs> wow. Uh let's see here. Yeah, I'm looking for some more questions. Oh, but yeah, movies. Um I'm trying to think of some Revolutionary War movies besides the Patriot. Turn so was there's I like really Turn not a lot as I a can show. think of. I like Turn as a show. Um Patriot was good. Uh Apple really TV is, is making lot. Apple TV is making That's a mini series about Franklin in France, which I'm going to cover today. So okay. this is going to be a, I have no idea if it's going to be good. I don't know how they're going to turn this in this An action movie. Yeah. So they're going to make it Napoleon 2.0. <laughs> yeah. We, that, so has any of you guys seen that yet, by the way? Oh, no. I've, I've, I haven't seen it yet either. I watched, I watched Waterloo religiously. Like, probably one of my all-time favorite movies um and i watched um uh the miniseries napoleon made in 2002 and it was surprisingly good uh i the the actor on that did it oh he nailed it he knocked it out of the park um let's see here but yeah i'd have to say patriot probably just because there's really not that very not that many Revolutionary War movies ever made. Yeah, it's a fun movie. It's yeah, just... and it is. <laughs> it it's is beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, let's see. It would be nice one day if Hollywood would make a very accurate description of you know a movie or a real life event into a movie. But well, I mean, let's be what... honest, they haven't done it yet, and they're not getting any better. Well, do you hear what Ridley Scott told uh, his historical advisor about you Napoleon? There. Yeah. <laughs> He, he basically he told him that, and then when people started calling him out for everything he got wrong, he said, "Get a life." Yeah. He's he might be on. He might be closer to senile than. I was I was having a lot of fun making memes about that movie about the war on instead of the battle of the pyramids, it was the battle against the pyramids. Anyhow, <laughs> moving on. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for some more comments. Uh. uh how common was the rifle in the Revolutionary War but from Antique Gunslinger? So they, they are present uh, throughout the entire war. So mm -hmm. outside of Boston, there's Virginians there with rifles. At the Battle of Great Bridge, which is in Virginia, you have Virginians with rifles. Um, at, later in the war, Guilford Courthouse, the, mm -hmm. the men on the flanks have rifles. Uh, rifles are common. Um, but it's a specialty so, weapon. It's a specialty weapon. They do exist, and they are uniquely American. The long, the long ones are the long ones, and that was yeah. what I was going to get into. Uh, contrary to popular belief, the British also used rifles, not as much, but they had the pattern 1776, which mine is ready. I just got to go get it. Um, they had the pattern 1776. They have the Ferguson, and both of those are in fairly limited numbers. And I've got to remember, I think there were 800 Pattern 1776 uh, normal rifles, and they had 200 of what they called the Hanoverian Pattern 1776, which was basically a Jaeger, which brings me into the other part of this, is you also have the German Jaeger. Um, the Hessians had those. So it wasn't just, uh, and there's actually a, I, do, have you gotten DeWitt Bailey's book on the uh, British service rifles, uh, Footlock service rifle? It's a really good read. Um, 
Rob from British Muzzle Loaders was the one that pointed me towards that one. And it, uh, there's some stories about uh, Washington's Irish uh, skirmish between Washington's Irish and uh, some of the British rifle troops up north. Uh, it was actually a really interesting story. Let's see here. There's also the <laughs> one of the Germans, Johann Ewald. You can read his wartime diary online, and that's spelled J-O-H-A-N-N-E-W-A-L-D. He was a captain in the Hessian Jaeger Corps, and he serves from New York City in 76 all the way to Benjamin uh, Benedict Arnold's uh, tobacco raids and the burning of, well, the attack on Virginia in 1781. Mm -hmm. And he, Michael Cicero, uh, he's written a bunch of books about Virginia, and he pulls heavily from Awald's uh, primary sources. You talk about how like the Benedict Arnold deploys the German riflemen like all the time. Like these guys are getting yeah. worked, but they would move and flank and they would always push back larger numbers of uh, Virginia militiamen. And there's a bunch of, so he's a really great primary source if you want to hear about it. What I find interesting is Benedict Arnold, if you read about the history of the pattern 1776 rifle, the, I think it was the 800 standard pattern 1776. Most of those were actually sent to benedict arnold and they were issued out to tory oh, troops. okay so um yeah turkey creek says if he remembers right i can't remember the number on this one uh but he said if he remembers correctly there were only 100 ferguson rifles there weren't that many <laughs> there weren't that many but it is a it's a disgrace that none of us have one Allegedly, Ferguson had George Washington in, in his yep. sights of Brandywine. Allegedly. I, allegedly. 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 Uh, from a certain point of view. Yeah. From his, My yeah. favorite still <laughs> is when he said, God himself couldn't take me off this mountain. And God was like, you know what? I'll God. allow it. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll allow, allow it. For certain. We do know what happens to him. So he, uh, He's still on that mountain today. Yep. Yeah. Which is funny because I don't know if you ever, Snapper, I'm sure you have. You ever read Louis L'Amour? We talked about I, this. We talked yeah. about this. There's actually a Louis L'Amour book called The Ferguson Rifle. And I remember you telling me about that. Yes, yeah. I remember you telling I was like, that sounds so familiar. That and yes, my, I still want to look into it. That was my yeah. introduction to the Ferguson as probably a six or seven-year-old kid. Garrett used to sit there and we'd he'd read us boys' books by the fire. And one of the books was The Ferguson Rifle. And it's a story about this kid who helps out Ferguson uh during the revolution and he is gifted one of his rifles one of his ferguson rifles and the story is about how after the revolution this kid takes this ferguson rifle in the 18 or well early early 1800s and he goes out west with the uh long hunters and guys like that going way out in the missouri and whatnot and uh, they have a shooting competition where he says he can get off six shots a minute with his rifle and they laugh at him <laughs> and then he said yep uh, i got my six shots a minute off <laughs> it's a it, it's a it's a that would been like book. having a super weapon back then yeah it's a fiction book but as a kid to hear a story about this ferguson rifle and the other really interesting thing about that book is he talks about the uh, process they went through for tanning hides and i tried hmm. his process as a kid and it worked hmm. <laughs> so that was the brain tanning right Yep, brain tanning and the smoking of the hide and everything like that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm looking for some more questions. Not very many kids today, I think, under the age of 10, would be even willing to try that. <laughs> the yeah. world has changed a lot since then. I did a lot of trapping as a kid. Uh, let's see here. David W. says he has a Lehman and it doesn't go off without setting the back trigger. Yep, same with mine. Uh, set triggers. Is the trade musket and the Fowler the same thing? I can tell you from the French point of view, but I'll let Revere. I would, go I, would, and go. I would say no, right? Trade muskets for this is outside of my wheelhouse. I would so say no. The French had a they they differentiate. I'm not even going to try to use that word right now. They. <laughs> made different models. So for an actual trade musket, you had the Fusil de Trait, which was no thrills, no frills, just a straightforward musket. And then for a Fowler, you had the dedicated Fusil de Chasse, which was a little more refined, but they were basically at heart the same gun. 
It's just the trade muskets are always a little cheaper. And I know with the Northwest trade gun going later on, um, yeah, it's uh, they're made to be mass produced, basically. Oh, Garrett nailed it. Yep, going back to favorite Revolutionary War movie. I don't know why I didn't think of this. Johnny Tremaine from Walt Disney. I don't know if you've ever seen that. That's probably my favorite. Old Walt Disney show. Really good one. I watch it every Independence Day. Let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, uh, Louisiana Gray says he likes the Patriots' close resemblance to the Swamp Fox. Yep. A little Francis Marion in there. Yeah, it is a fun movie, even though it's not accurate. It is a fun movie. I, yeah. I do have to give it that. It's a good entertainment, and it's a good, I don't know, just get away from it and feel like yeah. the, the sights look right, you know? Looks like you're actually back in, but yeah. It's like Riviera 311 said down here, there's something about that scene at that farmhouse. I agree. That nighttime battle or like early morning foggish battle, that is, you actually could feel the, you could feel the fear in it when that, he comes that close to you. Yep. It, it's good. They, they did a good, a really good job with that part of the movie. Really good job. Yep. Oh yeah. Uh, Turkey Creek 1823 says every April 19th, he watches April morning. That's another one. I, I watched Johnny Tremaine on, on April 19th. I watched Johnny Tremaine a couple times a year. It's a good one. Um, there's that, there's a, there's a scene on that, uh, Johnny Tremaine. I just like so much where, um, I think it's Pitt Karen is talking to Dr. Joseph Warren before everything kicks off. And, uh, Pitt Karen tells Dr. Warren, which Dr. Warren is another one of the unsung heroes of the revolution. Yeah. Probably, Daniel Mo- Daniel Morgan and Joseph Warren are two of my favorites. Um, don't die early in the war. That's a yeah, bad exactly. For your, bad for your reputation is to die early in the war. But I mean, if you're gonna go out, that's one way to yeah, go, out, go out. Go out of Bunker Hill. <laughs> <laughs> go out of Bunker Hill, covering the retreat. Yeah. Um. Didn't they? Didn't they do a deal here recently on they uh, found his skull, and they say he been executed. Yeah, he was executed yeah. with a 62 caliber pistol or a 60 caliber ball. Um, which they were like, yeah, that's a, that's a pistol shot. Um, but, uh, no, there's a scene on there where Pitt Karen's talking to Joseph Warren and he said, I, and this is Walt Disney before we get started here. He goes, I see that your men have been, uh, drilling, uh, every Sunday on their local village greens. This needs to be stopped immediately. I see that they are amassing weapons, powder, and ammunition. These need to be, re- uh, relinquished to the government. He's like, I need you to go tell them to do this. And Dr. Joseph Warren looks at him. He said, that I cannot do. Well, why not? Because free men will never relinquish the means of which they are to defend their liberty. I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I get if only people today had that same concept. Yeah, Walt Disney won't make a movie about that. Make that no, not movie today. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, the Allegheny Uprising. Earl Shaner puts that up there. Uh, when my uh, my wife's my father in law passed away a couple of years ago, uh, we went up to New York and where they're from, and we went to I forgot the exact name of it, but it's Fort Clinton, and I forgot the name of the other fort that's there. But they were revolutionary forts that were actually defeated by the British. And man, it's weird going to a place like that. You could see where all the you know the the barracks were all that stuff where you could actually go there. You can see the massive cannon and uh, knowing that we lost there is a weird feeling. It is, I don't know. It's still to this day, it kind of gets you upset, especially if you're, you know, in the armed forces, cause you're like, we, we don't lose. I mean, yeah. we do lose. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> it's not, it's not something we walk away from very well at all. Even 200 plus years later. That's- um, it's eerie. It's super eerie being in. And you see how small these forts were. Like Fort Clinton, yeah. man, I mean, it, you could throw a rock across the entire thing easily. Easily. I, like I mean, a foam ball you could throw across the thing easily. I like Fort Ticonderoga. I always think of it. And I don't know why, because I always think of Fort Ticonderoga as the fort that uh, changed sides every time the wind changed. <laughs> <laughs> it got captured. At, the French had it, and then the British had it, and the Americans had it. Uh, but I'm no. thinking the name of that fort. What you said, Snapper, is interesting because there's another one of these myths about the Revolutionary War 
that the Americans were always on top and that we were superior in everything we did because of our riflemen in the trees and that we and the British were stupid for fighting in lines and with their inaccurate smoothbore muskets. And I always find that as kind of counterintuitive for one, it's making your, it's making the achievement that the American soldier gained during the revolutionary war less trivial. Valuable. It makes it trivial, like not that important, not as big. It was easy. Yeah. Um, oh, they're just a bunch of rednecks in the woods. That's why they won when they just took on the greatest army in the world at the time and won. People don't realize uh, we lost a lot of different places, but we just won where it counted. <laughs> yep. It's a miracle. And it truly is. It's a miracle that we won. What? At the what? end of the day, yeah, it's a miracle. What's your thoughts on that, Rivero 311? No, I was going to say there's a great Nathaniel Green quote. Speaking of uh, underrated yeah. Americans yes. in history, he has the quote that says, "We fight, we get beat, we rise and fight again." Yep. I mean, if you just, I mean, that's just chills. Like <laughs> Nathaniel Green goes down to the south and he loses at. Well, lose. He just goes down, but he keeps his army. He he's not destroyed, and he just keeps fighting and fighting, and he grinds out a victory. But yep. yeah, and he. Won I don't know if that's an American thing or just a a common just guy thing that when you lose, you're now twice as eager to go into the next battle. Yep. It, it makes you more and more, you, you want to be there more at the beginning. You're kind of like, you know what? I can do this. I want to do this for the right reasons, but am I really want to die for this. And then after your first or second or third battle, it gets to the point where you're obsessed with it and that's all you want to do. And I'm trying to think of, uh, it was several years ago, I went into a very deep uh, study of Francis Marion and uh, Bannister Tarleton. And it was interesting, their two different methods of fighting, how they would how they would wage war. And Francis Marion's was, and this is going to be paraphrasing, but what he would say is always leave. And I think, Snapper, you had said that this was uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War. I think it was you or somebody had so said that. But he said, never completely surround your enemy because if you give him a chance to run, he'll take it <laughs> at the first sign of adversity. Mm -hmm. And Tarleton's was, I, I can't remember this off the top of my head, but basically it was um, look for a sign of weakness and then send your cavalry in as hard and fast as you can or something like that, which uh, kind of didn't pan out for him very my, well. My favorite now, saying of all time is still the, Sir, we're through. surrounded, and it's perfect. We got the enemy right where we want them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, favorite thing yeah, of all it, time. That's what I was. I think I mentioned that sometime. Tarleton really did pull a Custer at Calpins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we caught him napping, boys. <laughs> yeah. Oh nope. N never mind. <laughs> never mind. Uh, at Little Man says, "Love Johnny Tremaine as a kid." All right, Turkey Creek 1823 says there were civilian fouling pieces built one at a one at a time, and then there was the trade guns. Very similar, but trade guns were more cheaply made and imported by the tens of thousands. There you go. And like I said, Turkey Creek is the guy to talk to. I mean, he really knows his yeah. stuff on that. Um, which came first, the English or the French trade gun? I think the French. Because the fusee uh the Fousey Detroits were coming out in the late 1600s. Uh, matter of fact, the flintlock we know, the flintlock mechanism we know and love today is called sometimes the French lock. Because uh, that's really where it comes from. The English were still wanting to use a snap-on style. What's your thoughts on that, Rivero 311? Oh, it's, uh, I, I need to learn more about trade guns. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm probably I'm shooting, out of my wheel. I'm probably shooting myself in the foot there. But I think it's the French. I, I would agree with that because the French, as they had a lower population count in New France, they were more engaged with the natives. They're more, mm -hmm. you know, everyone knows they have the deeper alliances. The English sometimes do not so much. Yeah. So, you know, like, so. Uh, and a lot of that boils down to the reasons for being in North America, I think. Because yeah, the, the French. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, said so, no. Was, the French are trying to. They're commercializing in the furs, and they're in the backwoods. Yeah, and then the English are like. I mean, you Jamestown is basically a military, private military contract company. Mm -hmm. You know, 
you have all the Puritans that leave England because of religious reasons. You have the Catholics that go to Maryland. You have Puritans that aren't Puritan enough that go to Rhode Island. Yeah, so <laughs> like there's a whole, you have the Dutch, which, you know, in New York, and they're trying to do uh, mercantilism. Yeah, that word. But yeah, I would, I would, I would assume that the uh, the English would be let. This would be, I guess. This, what would you say that you can make the generalization that the English would be less likely to hand guns to people that they know they're going to be here for? Like, we're not, yeah. we're expecting to move. You know, like there is yeah. progress. They would eventually, thing. but yeah. I always looked, I always looked at it this way: the French came to North America because of their love for high fashion in Paris. And the best way to get things like felt was from beavers. So they set up trap route, trapping routes. And they really weren't here. I mean, yes, they colonized, but they weren't here like the English were, where it was all about God, family, and farms, and land, yeah. and land. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was really kind of the contingency, or the contingency, wow, that was the wrong word there. That was really kind of the... Uh, problem that started the french and indian war uh was because and that's why the french i think lost in the long run is because they weren't as established but uh as i like to have you ever heard of the lead plate expedition where they just went around and started throwing lead plates up to say this is my rank my <laughs> this is my this is the Ohio river but, yep just everything yeah. on this side of the river is part of france but no we yeah. have our lead plate that's uh <laughs> <laughs> I think it was John Wayne that said a man should only be allowed to own as much land as he can defend. <laughs> well, the French lost. France, so. the French didn't get the the memo on that one. You need a navy. Yeah, <laughs> got to have a navy. Got to have a navy. And even on that uh, lead plate expedition, they talked about they're going down the river and they're just seeing English farms popping up on both sides of the rivers. They're trying to claim it all. <laughs> <laughs> Yorktown uh, is there because of a French naval victory. The greatest victory in the American Revolution happens because of the French Navy. Yeah. So it's always that. And then fun it never. Fact. <laughs> and then, and then yeah. it never happened again. <laughs> they don't. They don't win very many ship-on-ship -ship encounters. Yeah. No. no, not yeah. after that. Let's see the Battle of the Nile. No, nope. no. Nope. The Battle of uh, what was the one that happened in the Caribbean, like right after Yorktown? Is it the Battle of the Capes? Battle of the Saints? Battle of Saints? We had the Battle of the Chesapeake right before Yorktown. They won yeah, that and one. then and then he go De Grasse goes down and loses like <laughs> right in seventeen immediately. Yeah, uh, and then, of course you got Trafalgar. Yeah, that one didn't turn out too well. I read a uh, while I was on those orders. I read Napoleon in Egypt, and I read about the disaster that was the Battle of the Nile. Ooh, the French were yeah. painting their ships with flammable paint. And they saw the British warships coming into the uh, the harbor at dusk, and they said, "I ah, don't worry about setting up for battle. They won't attack until morning because we never fight at night." Napoleon was thirty miles away and saw his biggest flagship go up in a giant fireball. <laughs> I was like, "Oh man, uh, yeah." Hey, give me a minute, guys. I gotta go check something out. There's okay. quite a bit of stuff going out here. I'll be okay. right back. Uh, can you? Pause or turn off my. I go. I can mute you. Oh, there we go. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Hardy says something that most people don't talk about much. What would a rifleman shooting bag setup look like? Did they really string a bunch of stuff from the strap like we do now? Only surviving, like we do now, any surviving complete set. I Rifles is yeah. such its own cultural, the amount of energy. I don't have an answer. I do French muskets. Yep, exactly. <laughs> that, like, that is uh, the, the uh, rifleman, that it's its own subculture in reenacting and history. Like mm -hmm. the amount of knowledge it takes. I love muzzle loading would probably have a great answer to that. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of with you on that one. If you told, if you asked me about British muskets, depending on the day of the week, I might be able to, or British rifles, I might be able to answer you. But I, I'm like you, it's kind of French musket stuff for yeah. me. Um, 
which we haven't talked about a whole lot. Well, we still got some time. We'll talk about some French muskets here in a little bit. Get some of these oh, questions I got answered. The thing. It was the Battle of the Saints. Uh, Comte de Grasse goes down and he loses. Yep. Yep. Right. Okay. I might need to get going pretty soon, boys. I got okay. a couple things I got to to fix out there before it breaks or destroys itself. Uh, Antique yeah. Gunslinger says he wants to build the earliest version of trade gun northeast type. Yeah, he was the one asking about uh, which came first, English or French trade guns. Uh, Antique Gunslinger, for that, you would probably have to ask Turkey Creek 1823. Like I said, he knows a lot about trade guns. Um, he's got a YouTube channel. Go check it out. Uh, yeah, he could probably fill you in on that. Let's see here. Uh, um, uh. Uh, Soylent Green says, you are so right, Revere. He's like, I reenact Revolutionary War also, and the riflemen are completely different. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh... Well, I think we're caught up on questions. So let's talk French muskets. All right. So, uh... <laughs> hey, guys. I'm going to have to pile leave. Um, okay. If I can come back on, I will. All right. But, yeah, I'm going to have to get going. Okay. See you. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Yeah, you too. Take care, gentlemen. I will try to come back on if I can. Okay. Bye. All right. So let's go. All right. So uh, I've prepared a lot of notes. I'm very excited about to do this. Thank you so much for having me on. Yep, uh, no I spend way too much time looking at this stuff. And anyways, so I'm going to be going over uh, French French arms and American independence. It's going to have in the, the American situation, the French situation, the exchange, the war and the post-war. So we're going to start off with the American situation. 1775, the war begins and 13 colonies head into war. You can say they stumble into war and an army has to be created while they're fighting. And you're going to have a lot of problems facing this Continental Army. And we're just going to cover them very, very at the 10,000 foot level. You're going to have a lack of equipment. The Continental Army faced severe shortages of essential military supplies, including weapons, ammunition, clothing and food. They have limited training. They have inadequate funding. Remember, this is the Continental Congress, so they don't really have the... They're doing uh, taxes by... How much taxes do you want to pay? You know, <laughs> and uh, people don't like that. So how about none? <laughs> yeah, not, it's hard to get money. Thankfully, the French are eager to loan out uh, sufficient funds to finance the Army's needs, leading to insufficient funds, leading to difficulties in paying soldiers and purchasing equipment. Logistical challenges. The logistics of supplying and maintaining an army over long distances were challenging, especially remember this is 1775 and you're fighting a war on the east coast of North America. So we're going to be talking, we're going to jump right into it. During the 11, month, the 11 month siege of Boston in early 1776, George Washington reports that there are nearly 2,000 men without muskets. Is this the Out same time whenever he shows up in the camp and he uh, finds the sentries drunk on duty? This would be a few months <laughs> after that. Oh, okay. Washington is not a fan of the New England <laughs> Army that he has now been put in charge of. Yeah, uh, two thousand men don't have muskets, and it's estimated he has seven to sixteen thousand men total. So that means twelve to twenty-eight percent of his men outside of Boston are without arms. During the siege, there were parts where the men had no more than nine cartridges a man. The British sixty. So he's yeah. trying to hold in, he's pieced together, and riflemen are actually there. Riflemen are up there, and they're doing harassing fire. And they're also doing their own thing, because, because riflemen are their own special creatures. But what kind of guns do exist uh, for the Americans at that time? So you have your English pin-style muskets, or you can call them a king's musket. It was how George Washington referred to it. These are required, uh, acquired from various sources, including British supply ships captured by colonial vessels, also when you raid armories, arsenals, weapons pickups. Um, so the next type is French muskets. How many French muskets were there at the beginning of the war? Well, not that many. French, <laughs> Saint Antonin, Saint Antin? Saint Antin. Saint Antin? I'm gonna yep. have to slow down my talking. <laughs> uh, were captured, very few were captured during the French and Indian War. When the British captured, um, about 7,000 of these muskets at Quebec, they did not disarm the Quebec militia. There was also very limited trade between British America and French Canada. Even after the British 
take control of New France, very few French muskets were used in America. They were actually mostly sent to Britain to be used as trade guns. So there, we can tie it in uh, with natives in the Canadian provinces, limiting, limiting their presence in America. So we're going to look at the act of regulating and disciplining the militia. And we'll look at the Virginia from 1777, something I'm pretty uh, comfortable with. Every non-commissioned officer and private with a rifle and a tomahawk or a good fire lock and bayonet with a pouch and horn or a cartouche or cartridge box and three charges of powder and ball. That is what the militiaman is required to have. Again, we kind of talked about it earlier, that good fire lock. There's nothing about caliber. There's no have it engaged because they have no way to, you just bring your ball and your powder and you size it to yourself. So You're it wasn't like, it wasn't like Jamestown, because I thought that was interesting. At Jamestown, they actually had a requirement uh, before coming there that you had to have over 70 caliber. Anything under that was not considering musket, a ah, musket caliber. So no. that's why I, <laughs> they're just like, bring it. <laughs> no, that, that's straight from the 1777 <laughs> Militia Act. It's basically the same thing in the 1755 Militia yep. Act. So they just, no caliber requirements. So you're going to have your guns would be Fowlers, like we talked about, mixed parts, militia muskets. I don't know the best way to really describe what these American sourced mixed parts guns are. Sometimes you just hear them referred to as militia muskets. And then your rifles are going to be limited by geography. Rifles are pretty much connected to hunting. They're more in your western, uh, closer to the Appalachia, Virginia, western Pennsylvania, North Carolina. George Washington in October 1775 writes, in the manufacturing of arms for public use, great care should be taken to make the bores the same size. This is <laughs> awesome. I found this quote recently. George Washington says we need to have the same caliber of muskets. Yeah. That the same ball may answer and otherwise great disadvantage may arise from a mixture of cartridges. These are the things you have to have in your brain housing group when you're in charge of supplying an entire army is these minute details that become very prevalent very early on. So colonial efforts for arms production. So there's limited production capabilities within the colonies that were utilized. Local gunsmiths would receive orders to make guns and also from orders of committees of public safety. To meet the increasing demand for arms, states and the Continental Congress centralized storage and repair facilities. Uh, they also created arsenals in Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, and Virginia. Just for example, I was able to find out Maryland had 12 shops and can produce 240 muskets a month. So wow, <laughs> keep this, keep that number in mind because I'm going to be talking about musket production throughout this whole thing, yep. and you're going to be blown away by the, how many muskets the French produce. Benjamin Franklin proposed to the Pennsylvania Assembly to engage in mus musket production within the colonies. He does this in August of 75, suggesting the acquisition of 2,000 muskets annually for 10 years. So that's not going to make <laughs> that's, Yeah. <laughs> but this is an interesting part that comes from this uh, Ben Franklin quote. I intend, therefore, to propose to our assembly to give the encouragement here by encouraging to engaging to take 2,000 muskets per annum for 10 years, all right, at a good price. Well, I doubt not will in that time establish the manufacturer among us and an arsenal with 20,000 good fire locks in it. That's because the hardest piece to make is the fire lock, is the lock. So they can, they can source the stocks, they can source the bands, and you'll kind of see through this arsenal process, they actually have thousands of individual pieces scattered around repair facilities, and they put them together. One of the America's uh, U.S. government contracts from the late 1790s, they just buy thousands of locks from Ketland in England. And they're French-style locks that are bought from England, but they just want the locks. You get the locks over here, we can make the stock, we can yep. do the barrels, we can blow enough barrels and proofing to get something, so we'll be fine with that. Yep. So Benjamin Franklin says we should do this to other colonies as well, starting that whole process of bringing all 13 colonies in together, starting to create those united colonies that would become the United States. In September of 1775, the Second, Second Continental Congress, the Secret Committee, so that's basically like a spy ring, mm -hmm. they, have, they have import goals. We're going to import 46-pounder brass cannon, 20,000 musket locks, 
10,000 stands of good arms. It's going to be paid for by the Continental Congress. Then they're going to be, we will provide to uh, Europeans, we'll give them produce. It's going to be tobacco, rice, but we'll, we will not give them hogs, cattle, sheep, or poultry. We're going to try to keep that here in America. We're not trying to hand away the things that we can use to sustain an army. And by 1775, state governments and Continental Congress began issuing contracts for arms production. So that's the American situation. Again, stumbled into a war. We're now at war. All right, let's start grabbing stuff. So what's happening on the other side of the Atlantic? The French. They lost the Seven Years' War. Yep. And they lost nearly all of their land claims, nearly all of their land claims in North America and trading interests in India under the Treaty of Paris. One of many treaties of Paris. <laughs> so they start to begin in 1763 to arm their army with, this is where we're getting into the French muskets, mm -hmm. the model of 1763. The stain bill. <laughs> yeah, that's in the year. The French arms production was centralized as, you're going to have to tell me what this is, in Mabouche, Mabou? Mabouche. Mabouche, Charleville, yep. and you can do the same. I don't know. Saint-Étienne, or Saint-Étienne. Saint-Étienne. Artisanal workshops under contract divided the production and final assembly was centralized in Mabouche and Charleville's Royal Armories. In St. Etienne, muskets were assembled by contractors. So two of them, even though they are royal arsenals, two of them, uh, saint Etienne is using contractors for whatever reason. Yeah. And that's when we're going to enter uh, Monsieur de Montebilliard. Who's going to be, uh, he's basically him and the group of all, they don't mesh. I don't know. No. <laughs> but, yeah. In order, he shows up in order to lighten the infantry's weapons. So they come out the 1763. They want to have a sturdy, reliable gun. And it's light. just you. They want a yeah. light gun. <laughs> yeah. And now they're just like, now nah, we want a light gun because this thing is way too heavy. Uh, so Mont Bouillard, and this actually comes from that French book I bought from that, that gentleman that told me to get it. That yeah. I'm trying to translate saw fit to adopt the Dragoon musket they had just developed for the infantrymen. So they took that, and that is going to lead into creating the 1766. This artisanal process was strained to, deme uh, to meet demand, but it exceeded the capacity of any other system. The Royal Inspector of Manufacturers described saint Antienne in 1778. The whole town, he wrote, is shrouded in coal smoke with that penetrates everywhere. He estimates that 30,000 people live and work around saint Etienne. All of them are occupied at the forge. Men, women, children, boys, <laughs> girls, armor, the dogs, the cats. Iron <laughs> yeah, ironmongers, metal workers of all sorts. You cannot have any idea for the number of forges and their activity. These are the true dens of Vulcan. And these are the production numbers. 1763, 88,000 guns. 1766 to 69, 140,000 guns. 1770 to 1774. I've gotten mixed numbers on this. So we're going to say 80 to 200,000 guns. I, I've See, had I've conflicting heard, numbers. I've yeah. heard 77,000. So I've seen 77,000. Yeah. I've seen, yeah. So, uh, so these numbers need to get really flushed out yeah uh 73 you have 29,000 74 you have 66,000 and then well 1777 is too late for us we're, we're yeah we're not we're, going that far even though yeah. it's a great year <laughs> so remember 240 a month at maryland all right so you know it's just a state or right, what how's america do in 1810 harper's ferry is making 10,000 a year yep so so <laughs> I'm gonna. I gotta mention something here. Garrett yeah. has read, and I don't know if I'd mentioned this to you uh, yet or not. Uh, but Garrett had read. He's been reading Springfield books day and night for the Springfield oh. trapdoor, obviously. And we talked about Henri Blanc, right? Yeah. The guy who uh, helps develop the 1774, the 73. Uh, no, not 73. Not 73. Not the. Uh, <laughs> not that one. Uh, the 74, though, and I had mentioned in my 1777 video that he had disappeared and I didn't know where he went because I couldn't find any more information about him after that, uh, especially during the years of the Revolution. Garrett is reading his Springfield book, and evidently Henri Blanc was very good friends with this guy I'm sure nobody's ever heard of called Thomas Jefferson. And he comes to the United States 
and he is tasked with setting up two armories. He set up he sets one up in the style of Saint Etienne and one in the style of Charleville. Oh, the one okay. one is for mass production and one is for uh, experimental, well, not necessarily experimental, but you know, trying to advance technology of the guns. R one he designed yeah. for mass production based off of Saint Etienne was set up at Springfield. And the one based off of Charlottesville was set up at Harper's Ferry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I need out. to know this because Harper's Ferry is my other half of the collection. So yeah, yeah. Anyhow, carry on. I just thought that was an amazing piece of information Garrett dug out of that Springfield book. I was like, hey, that finishes the story. <laughs> we'll have to come back and talk about the interchangeability of parts because everybody said they did it, but the, who actually did it? That's a whole different I got some information I... on that too about <laughs> Springfield and French, uh, American and French interchangeability of parts. But anyhow, continue. Charlie Mike. Okay. So the they come out and they have this new model 1766. And then they're like, well, we have all these 1763s that we just made, so we're just going to lighten them. So they're going to take that same uh, lock plate, they're going to lighten the barrel and lighten the stock. But there is, it's going to be called a 1763. Uh, they're also known as the Stonville muskets, and they're also sent to Leger Arsenal uh, to a, a, was developed to address the weight issues of these. Um, these can be called a 1763 light, and then you have your 1763 heavies. Or, as Peter Soli likes to sell theirs, they have a 1763 <laughs> Leisure slash 66 that don't exist online, and they only exist in kits. So I, I like they, their their 1766, which is heavily, no pun, maybe pun intended, heavily inspired on a 1766 Heavy, or 63 Heavy. <laughs> yeah, I know, and I want one. I want one I do so too. bad. <laughs> but they don't exist. There, the, there is a kit on uh, Hanging Out. Yeah. I don't say where it's at. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So Monsieur de Montbelliard, he's the inspector of the factory say NTN. He played that key role in reducing the weight. Um, so the, these these are some information I actually pulled from that that French book, which how do I say arms, a few Francis models de ordnance system 1763, 266. Um, should I present these? It's just a couple pictures of the locks if you want to look at it. Okay, How's I don't that? know how well, quite do that. It says I can present. Okay. And I don't work. Or if I share my screen. Yeah, well don't we don't we won't worry about it because I don't want to mess it up. But I have I have close-up photos of those locks. And the interesting thing about it is that it actually has the different barrels. So we now know what a 1763, 66, a 70.71, a 73, and a 74 barrel are, not because of the bayonet lug, but because of the anti-rotation lug that is underneath the barrel. So we can now accurately date these these uh, these musket barrels, which I need to go back and take apart my original and see what I think it's a 70 barrel. But anyways, so that um, anti-rotation lug, anti-rotation lug. Is that what, what they call the bayonet lug? <laughs> no, so they have. I'm looking at uh, one, the 1773. I'll send this to you on the uh, something else, but they have two okay. anti rotation lugs literally just a lug under the barrel, not a bayonet lug. They must have quit doing that around because, well, I'm, I know my A and 9 doesn't have it or the 79. No, um, so the 63 has it, the 66 has it, the 70 71 does not have it, the 73 has it, the 74 has one only at the the end near the bayonet lug. So that's something else I'm going to have to put on my 66. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to figure out about brazen that. it on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, like I said, I'm building a 74, which I'm actually fairly close with being done on. I've actually got the lock and everything built up. Oh, wow. I may have Where to get a lock from. What's that? Where did you get a lock from? So I got a uh, parts kit from the rifle shop and I got the lock castings. From them and i actually built the lock from the castings whoa and it's That's uh awesome. it's fast it is a very fast lock uh one thing i'll say though i've noticed from handling my a and nine and my 79 is i've noticed that there i, I need to I, I actually ordered another mainspring because i'm going to try to stretch it a little bit because i noticed that the spring tension is a little light for what i'm expect, expecting out of that french musk and i'm expecting that 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right back. But anyhow. All right. Sorry, I keep interrupting you, but I keep on oh, talking about things. <laughs> I need to slow down how fast that's No, long. you're good. It's good uh, information. No, no, it's been great to share it. So despite being referred to as the light, it was actually heavier than the model 1754 musket that it was meant to replace. And that is just every government contract I've ever heard of. Hey, yep. we can do this better, faster, quicker. And it didn't happen. Uh we'll skip over some of the most of this is just the dimensions i didn't know if we needed that so the muskets can have iron mountings with a brass front sight raised at the top of the rear ring of the front barrel band that's always mm -hmm. good to look for always make sure that has a brass uh front sight post if not it could be a replacement if not it's probably the rifle shop because they just cast off of the mold or they cast off of uh, one so i've got to have... cut mine off and put brass on there I have an American Charlottesville video coming out this weekend that you can uh, enjoy, and that is a actual Charlottesville that ah. has a uh, front sight post that is not brass. But I'll leave the rest ah. of it. It was another mistake that we can always learn from. Yeah. Um, the French Royal Royal Navy utilizes this musket as well with iron furnishings replaced by cast brass to resist oxidation effectively. So if you see brass on barrel bands, just think Marine or Navy. Or, or imperial a, or imperial guards or so i guess don't listen to me because or if it has me. an iron middle barrel band that split <laughs> colonial fruit musket and you can buy it and you can just snag it for a thousand dollars yeah uh, yeah get that just yeah just also uh, you get a free 1766 bayonet and scab or original uh frog and scabbard with it too yeah definitely <laughs> yeah lucky <laughs> all right Officers' muskets were made from selected figured walnut and were lighter in weight compared to those intended for regular troops. So uh, we would refer to those as a fusil. The French refer to all of their muskets as fusils, uh, but the fusil for us, and I think the English would, I mean, they have the fusiliers, is a lighter musket. An officer fusil is the same sort of thing, a lighter musket. Not, they don't want it to get banged around. Um, and then... So we're, that's basically the 1766 system. We're going to come back to this. I want to get through the whole story first because I know we can just sit here and talk. 66. Yeah. <laughs> um, French military downsizing after the Seven Years' War contrasted with France's robust army and modernization efforts, leading to the surplus of muskets that are being able to be sold to the American colonists. At the same time that this is happening, our favorite, the one and only group of all, is modernizing artillery. He introduces standardized artillery pieces, improved gun carriages, and new methods for organizing and deploying artillery units. And he would go on to revolutionize that. So what you need to know is that he's basically up and coming from the artillery um, branch, and uh, Montbelliard is in the musket, and they kind of get swapped out. So if you're ever wondering why is there so many just variations is because these two men have a lot of personality is what I can pick up from the books and they keep getting in and out. So they come in and they, they want to yeah. change something. Yeah. Group of all wins in the end. Uh, he becomes famous <laughs> and then he dies conveniently right when the revolution begins. We don't yeah, know. Yeah. 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 Um, just... Something I was going to add to that. You're mentioning artillery making uh, muskets. If you read into French muskets and the development of them, you're going to notice a trend and that is, most of the designs, at least the decent ones, are by artillery officers. Oh. Um, also, by the way, there's actually a grip of all gun. That's an artillery piece that's actually called the grip of all gun. I think uh, Hearn Ironworks makes a replica. So grip of all, he lightens the art, the barrel and the chassis. Yep. So is it because they're better with the metal, metal working? They understand the metal working? Because I'm assuming... I knew... Pressure... I know he has the code of, I cannot think of the year. I don't have my, my books here with me. I think it's the code of 1777, I think, where he actually lays out in the regulation for the metal has to be of this quality. The wood has to be of this quality. Uh, Everybody has to be of this quality. Uh, but, yeah, so the grip of all gun, I'm trying to remember here. I saw one not too, or I saw a picture of one not too long ago. It's a, it's a little different looking. Cannon actually looks like an older one, but yeah, he designed a artillery piece that bears his name. Um, but yeah, 
He's he's, he's infamous on YouTube these yes. last four months. He's yeah, like, and that I can't, we both came out with videos like, uh, and, <laughs> and I'm I felt bad about it because I made my video. And I was like, man, nobody talks about this Gribbleball guy. I was like, nobody <laughs> talks about this 1777. And then I go and I look back, and uh, I don't think at that time I didn't know you made YouTube videos. No, and I went it. and sometimes you know I'll see people comment on the channel. I'll click on their uh, their channel and see if they're running one too. And I clicked on yours, and I was like. No, it was good. And I'm no, like, it's, great. it's the 1777. I was like, I'm perfectly beat me by like a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a mystery musket because, of, yeah, yeah. So, we're, <laughs> so that is the French situation, and now we're going to move into the war. This is the interesting part. This is going to include that shell company. So Louis the Sixteenth approves the setup of Rodrigue, Hortelez, and company to provide munitions for America. And just to kind of end about the French, tax revenues for the French was half a billion livres in 1780. France had spent 1.3 billion livres by the time the war ends. Yep. They are spending almost three times the amount of tax revenue. And, and it's not just the tax revenue, it's the interest. And also, America, we default and we don't pay back. <laughs> so... It sounds, what did they get out of it? They got a whole lot of nothing because, yeah. like, well, at least they won't be, we got, we showed them British what for. And the then, Americans definitely wouldn't start trading with them again. Yeah, we were trading. Like in 1784. <laughs> yeah, literally <laughs> like right year, out of here. Yeah. Uh, anyhow. So, but that's, that's in the future. This is 1775. It's the summertime. Yeah. And Francis's foreign minister, Vergen, has observed with great interest the, the troubles that is happening to British with their American colonies. And really early on, covert agreements were made for the shipment of arms, munitions, and supplies from France to America, facilitated by financial aid and secret agreements. In 1776, in the spring of 1776, Louis XVI gave his French foreign manager, uh, Minister Vergen, approval for, the, you're going to like this guy, View Marche. View yeah. Marche to set up a commercial firm, Rodrigue, Hortelas, and Co. to provide munitions for the Americans just, for money to buy them. Just started reading about that in the, you, uh, yeah. So he was Definitely in London. Definitely wasn't a shady yeah. deal. <laughs> no, he, he was like, we're not giving guns in to the Americans. London. Yeah, he was hunting. He was trying to hunt down somebody that was dressing in woman's clothes acting like Louis the 16th. And he was trying to like get back into the court. He's a whole character, but so we're going to have our key people. Now for the Americans, you're going to have Silas Dean, Arthur Lee and Benjamin Franklin for the French. You're going to have Louis the 16th, um, Virgin, and then Boumachar. So in 1766 in June, I need to stop saying so Rodrigue Horselas and company was set up for that French import export Spanish in name only. Because, you know, if it's a Spanish name, we're not doing it. Yeah. It reminds me of that scene from Lord of War. Yeah. What do you have on here? We have like, you have like 500,000 rounds of submachine gun ammunition. I'm hunting. I'm trigger happy. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. <laughs> and off the bat, the French are going to loan a million livres. And then the Spanish, because the Spanish are going to loan another million livres. And then there's going to be another million livres raised from French merchants. This is 1776. This is before yeah. America's even declared independence. The French, like uh, uh, Snapper was talking about, when you get beat, you want to come back and fight. I was thinking about this the yeah. whole time. The French want to, they they need that, that, yeah. the, that payback. And they're going to get it. So this is the public story they're going to go with. So we create this company, right? And the public story was that the Hortelas agents would use these funds to hire ships and buy military supplies in France for shipment and sale to neutral merchants in the Caribbeans. While there, Hortelas agents would use the money made selling arms to buy tobacco and rice for the American farmers. This produce would be brought back to the France and sold to help repay the investors for the startup funding. Bu Marche would keep any gain and bear any loss. France is going to send, it's going to be French arms on French ships with French money. This plan. That doesn't sound familiar. Yeah, no. So it's basically everything but the guys holding the guns. But we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, there's no course. Then there's a few of them even. Yeah, those will yeah. come in later. 
the and this was going to be around a couple islands, but the Dutch controlled the island of St. Eustace. The Americans could pretend to buy the arms there, and the U.S. vessels would then transport them to the U.S. with their own ships. Unfortunately, one of Dean Silas Dean's uh, colleagues was actually a British spy, so the British were fully aware of the scheme, even learning many of the ports and sail. Um, so R Colonel Arkady Gluckman right united states muskets rifles and carbines i should have found a way to present this but i'll it'll get presented later and he actually tracks down every single ship where they went the date of arrival how many muskets they offloaded so he said in february of 76 you have three thousand guns that go to connecticut uh you get ten thousand guns before 77 everyone kind of talks about spring of 77 is when the first french muskets this is actually pretty common uh, knowledge everyone's just like oh french muskets don't show up until 77. he actually has at least around ten thousand french muskets are brought in between uh february of 76 to november of 76. not not as many as thirty thousand that are dropped off in portsmouth and philadelphia but it's still a large number. And then the numbers keep going throughout the year. So well over 100,000 French arms were imported during the War of Ind uh, Independence for the Continental Troops, Navy, and Militia. The average price paid for these French muskets was 24 livres, approximately to $5 per musket. Now Isn't we're going to... Oh, sorry. Isn't that where Benjamin Franklin had mentioned? He was like, yes. even if we only got half the shipment, we're coming out. Oh, we're coming Paraphrasing, out. Paraphrasing, man, we're coming out. We're coming out real good. <laughs> that whole paragraph from that book, that's the beyond, is that, that's the French Arms in Colonial America book. That yeah. whole paragraph just kind of set me off on this because it's like, <laughs> what? The, so it's costing us $5 to import these from across the Atlantic Ocean. So if we wanted to make them. Included. Yeah, shipping and handling included. And also, we're not even paying for it with our money. We're paying yeah. for it with loans. Uh, American <laughs> we're not made arms. Back. <laughs> yeah, that we're going to. Sorry, France. Uh, American made arms obtained by contract averaged about $12.30. So you're almost getting two and a half guns, French guns, for having your own uh, guns made here in the States. And then these guns were also borrowed with money purchased from France. And now we're going to get to that amazing quote. Benjamin Franklin adds in the postscript of April 1777, we have purchased 80,000 fusils, a number of pistols, etc., of which the enclosed is the account for 220,000 libras. They were king's arms in second hand, but so many of them are unused and exceptionally good that we esteemed it was a great bargain if only if half of them should arrive. So it was just like, hey, whatever if we can get half of them we'll be very happy so yeah so that is the how the guns are brought in. now you want to talk about anything before i move into the war yeah so um why why these guns i'll, I'll talk a little bit about this one i guess why would these guns be unused for the most part oh, for the most part they're 63s to 66s right yep and uh, 70s, you're going to see, well, I, I don't think they get, the 74s are later shipments. Yeah, they don't get, limited that, number. Yeah, yeah, very limited numbers. A lot of them go actually to the uh, the Swiss Guard uh, mm. 74s. Um, but the 63s, 66s, you know your history. There's not a whole lot going on as far as war in France in the year, in the 1760s. Um, and... Uh, there's this big development pattern that's coming along and we get to 1777 and there's a new musket that is awesome that comes out in 1777 yeah. and the French are like, we're standardizing on this gun and they're like, we really don't need all the older models anymore. So as they're making more newer 1777s, they're selling off their old surplus or, you know, sending off their old surplus um, we're borrowing it without the intent of return. And, uh, yeah, so the 1777 is funny because, like we mentioned, let's go through the models, the m more popular ones. we got 1717. Actually, technically, you got 1716, uh, which was not standardized, but you have the 1716, the 1717, 1728, 1746, 1754, the 1763, the 1766, the 1768, kind of. 
1776, I kind of lump in with the 74, but all of these different models are not interchangeable with a new one. Yep, I so was about to just get yep. sent off. <laughs> no, I mean exactly to build off of that, and you would think like, why would you get away? Why would you hand off one hundred and forty thousand muskets? It's 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 because the locks are different, the yep. lock plates are different, the the band, like it's 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 taking up space in a way. Like yeah, and, they shoot the same caliber, so that's fine. But through a long duration yeah. war, here's a great stat I I just found out uh, during the War of eighteen twelve, America lost. A quarter of a million muskets. Yep. So it's just like that turnover rate is just like that's the pieces, the problems, the the maintenance. So yeah, that's why that 1777 is so important. And at what this problem, time what, frame, the French are very, very into interchangeable parts. And so at that point, it really doesn't make any sense to have all these different models. <laughs> yeah. And you can just use it to you know, thumb the British. So yep. it's just a win-win. It's a win-win for everybody. You would think it would be a win-win, but here in about, let's see, you're, you're, what year are you at now? You're at 76, 86. No. Yeah. Every... In about 13, 14 years, it's not much of a win-win yeah. anymore. Hey, 1783 was a very good year. So anything yeah. that, you know, 1789, not so much. No. That's where yeah. that's where we get to drop off though, because we're Americans, so we can just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let's, let's continue. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now we're in the warriors, and this is, I mean, this is the part that's just interesting for infantry guys, non-infantry guys, military, because like, how does this operate? And I did get research help from uh, Jim Gallagher. He's the gentleman that works at the museum in Yorktown. So how does how do you out, outfit the army? Well, it's kind of pulling from the militia system a little bit recruits often brought their own muskets when enlisting and they were allowed to keep them upon discharge. So they might've showed up with an English musket and left with the French musket. Okay. Just one more thing. I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. Yeah. No, you're good. You read Joseph Plum Martin's book. I'm, I'm sure working my way through it. I've skimmed it. Why? What is that mile long shot that is taken at? The that was what I was going to get. Yeah. I have, I and need dear to reader. That yeah. shot was taken at, as sure as I live and breathe, that shot was taken at over a mile. <laughs> yeah. And he said it was like a 14-inch or 14-foot barrel or something. No <laughs> one's talked about it. It's just sitting out there. If you want anything to do with history, the American Revolution is so undercovered. <laughs> Come yep. reenact. Get that involved. Poor red coat, that poor red coat picking apples a mile away, getting shot by a 14-foot long smooth war musket. Yeah, it was... <laughs> I uh, like, and he just, it's just like such a one off comment in his diary. There, yeah. like, what are you, what, how is this a thing? Like, how is this not talked about? That, <laughs> setting. that, and the, uh, the part where he talks about the Thanksgiving feast were the two that just got me as a, as an infantryman. Yeah. I was just chuckling so hard at the Thanksgiving feast. Congress gave us this huge Thanksgiving feast. Dear reader, would you like to know what it was? <laughs> It was like a the half problem, a gill of rice and a little bit of and a little bit of rum. The problem was he was educated and he could yeah. write. <laughs> yeah, he was a private the whole time. Yep. Okay. I'm sorry. I keep interrupting. No, you're good. Uh, you mentioned uh, troops bringing their own muskets, and that immediately popped into my head. <laughs> so this is this is where it's going to get pretty funny because you would you would think oh they bring their own musket that's a good thing like oh they're self supplying. But if you know anyone that has firearms, they very much are uh, close to said firearms. <laughs> yeah. Early in the war, Washington orders that no soldier upon the expiration of their term of enlistment was able to take with them any serviceable gun. If the musket was his private property, it would be appraised and he would be given the full value of it. Let's forget the fact that the Continental dollar due to inflation basically plummets and becomes useless. And yeah. the Continental Army is never rarely paid on time and you're having militia you're having mutiny problems all the way until january in the spring of 1781 yep. and finances are a problem so when washington's like i got an iou in continental dollars <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh surprise he was very upset people did not listen to him they would walk off with yeah and then this was these uh so there was part, yeah so there's <laughs> part where the state of massachusetts gets french guns and the state allowed yeah, the militiamen to buy the guns and washington's like no we cannot have these people thinking this is 
property of the United, the U.S. Congress, right? Like this is, it's going to be U.S. government property. And uh, there is that through line. Um, he, uh, Washington threatens to stop the last two months of pay due to a soldier if he walks away with his musket. All them press That's muskets it. just walking away. It's just, they just <laughs> grab, they're off, you know, just floating away. Um so he, that's just kind of a fun aside I was reading uh, just earlier today. So the, the first big batch comes into Portsmouth. So we're now let's talk more about the war years uh, or the, during the war. Um, 34,000 were brought in in that spring of 1777. They're intended for the Continental Army, but due to General Burgoyne, Johnny, General Johnny Burgoyne, Burgoyne marched down towards Fort Ticonderoga, many of those muskets were actually diverted to the New England militias. Uh, that totaled almost 9,000 militiamen who reinforced Gates at Saratoga. The French muskets really don't start to uh, get to the Continental Army until the army enters Valley Forge, December of 77 to 78. And prior to the Battle of Monmouth, there was very few, if any, French muskets in use by either side in the American Revolutionary War. So this is where that the three pillars is kind of important of your captured uh, pin style, your locally sourced guns, and your French guns. So you, I've, um, I had originally, from my comparison video, I kind of make, I, I sell too much. So if I, if I could go back and take some words out of a video, I would do that. Um, yeah. So we have to remember that's the three of, it's the three, the pillars that's holding up that stool. But they are, they do become more prevalent and sooner or later they will be a majority. Uh, so they come out more use in the later part of the war. The Philadelphia Supply Agency is a really interesting kind of aside. After the British evacuated Philadelphia in 1778, large, uh, France sent large quantities of arms and components to America, and the majority of them arrived in Philadelphia. These shipments were sorted, refurbished, and placed in storage as raw materials for gunsmiths who worked at repairing and stocking into complete arms, including Joseph Perkins, IP. Come, well, he's not... It's not confirmed that he's IP, but we, we with confidence, can say maybe it's IP. Yeah. So they have just barrel bands, locks, uh, barrels, stocks. And this book uh, behind me, um, U.S. Military Flintlocks, Early Years, Peter A. Schmidt, has all the different pieces, side plates. Every, they take the whole gun apart. And they, it sounds like they just put them in barrels and you just take the gunsmith goes and then they fit they have to go and hand fit everything yep. so there's just pieces hanging out inside these uh, agencies i believe so, you're talking about ip uh i marked my indian made gun old char my 63-66 beautiful i marked piece. it uh oh thanks i marked it ig and i, I remember i believe that was john gallet same john gallet? Uh, yep same uh establishment and everything but yeah, those markings are hard because I have IOC or ICC on my side plate for my yeah. French musket. And uh, I don't know <laughs> in things that say it seems to be Americans would mark it, but it could also be a personal brand. And they just I wish they would have just had a certificate they wrapped in the barrel. Yeah, just like yeah. sent from just, hey, uh, write this yeah. down and put it in the stock. I'm still trying to figure out whose name was on the side of my 1779. Yeah, I can't spell that. I was trying to. I was. <laughs> it was like so tank. I think it's tank. Tankel, tankul, or something like that. How do you say that in French? Tankul. Yeah. Speaking like of marks, though, so we're gonna do the marking. So Washington has this problem with people just five finger dis discounting all this government stuff. Tactically acquired. He's uh he's not a fan. He's also not a fan of heavy drinking. Uh he doesn't like drunkards. Um yeah. So he marking this is where the markings come in. Increase accountability and reduce the theft of continental property. Commanding officers were instructed to ensure compliance with the order with brands available from the commissary of the military. The decision in uh spring of 1777 to mark all continental arms with the letters US. And this is where it gets a little Schmidt, basically. The most of your markings you're going to see are U States, United States. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the war, actually like 82, 83, 
they might start stamping U.S. on the lock plate. So that's technically the war because the war ends in 83. Yorktown's mm-hmm. in 81, but the war goes to 83. Yeah. But after the war, in that interwar year, 83 to 94, you do see U.S. marked horizontally, vertically, and also on the barrel. So that is your property mark to the U.S. government, anyone that's been around any modern military they still do it. They still do it. Property, property U.S. government. US government. Yep. So <laughs> next, if you ever, if you're still in and you look at yours, uh, just think like, oh, I know. Just pull that pub trivia out to your S.I. PM. Yeah. Hey, sir. S.I. check. Uh, <laughs> I lost my knots. Yeah. yeah, especially if you're a new guy. Definitely go to your squad leader and tell them something. Yeah. Some units branded muskets with uh, marked barrels and bayonets with regimental company numbers. That's not as common as with the British muskets. The only ones I've really seen with this is New Hampshire. New Hampshire marks their uh, barrels or stocks. Maryland, I've seen markings. But the British muskets, it seems like they have much more prominence in uh, tracking unit history. Mm -hmm. Whatever that's worth. Um, so by 1779 onwards, this is where we can start to say, so the latter half of the war, the majority of muskets used by the Continental troops were French muskets. Uh, 1781, just random, just to give you an example, 4,000 French muskets were sent to the Southern Army before and after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. They came from Philadelphia. So these store storage facilities are kind of scattered around, and when needed, they send them out. And they mm-hmm. actually... They give out French infantry muskets to militia at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, which I found was kind of interesting. So they have enough muskets to go around that by that time, they even have enough muskets for the militia to have it. Yep. So So, something that I had read, and this was in my reading for the 1774, was that you were talking about the storehouses. They would have so many muskets set out and then as needed, issue them out. I had read that... They would do this by, they were like, okay, we're going to use the older style of what we have the most of, which is obviously the 66. Uh, we're going to use those first, and then we'll move on to the uh, limited amount of 70s, 73s, uh, and 74s, okay. which is why there's not actually a whole lot of 177. I mean, there are some. There's not a whole lot of 1774s used by American troops during the revolution. And then after the war, whenever the U S government is in dire straits, cause they're broke, they actually sell off a lot. They standardize on the 66 and sell off ah. the 74 is a surplus. So you actually see more 74 is coming out. What was then West Kentucky, Tennessee, places like that as fouling pieces. <laughs> than you I did in the war. I need to confirm if I have a 73 or 74 uh, cock on mine because it's I it will, reinforced and it's rounded, but I don't. I think you have you would have a 74 or okay. a 70 because the 73 they went back to the uh, the flat. Oh, okay. Flat cock. Of course they would. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't yeah, they? <laughs> I have a 1754 cock on that came on that 1779 just sitting over there at the shelf I'm on a shelf at my house. Hey, you have all the pieces. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'll tell you this. It doesn't work very well with the 1779 lock. <laughs> yeah. That was, a, that was a good fix you did. Oh, yeah. Was, I, was, yeah I, was sending you, I was sending you the proofing stuff. I was reading about how they uh-huh. proofed barrels. And I was like, man, as long as you didn't submerge it underwater and leave it outside, <laughs> you can generally gauge. Yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, no, it was kind of funny because you're already preemptively getting ahead of the comments that were going to come yeah. because you were shooting a gun. It was just like, I'm doing this for a reason. <laughs> for a reason, <laughs> yes. And uh, before I let you go, I'll let you get back to it. That interchangeability of parts, I think, is funny because I had people telling me, you can't, they're like, it's a lock, stock, and barrel are the only parts that are interchangeable. And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, because I, I took it apart and I was cleaning. I was like, I wonder. A and nine main spring. Wow, what do you know? Fits right in there. Seventeen seventy four yeah. uh, trigger spring, right in there. Interchangeable. That's also, also negated by the whole fact that they had the Philadelphia Supply Agency that was just building guns. There, yeah. you know, it's recorded. <laughs> so yeah, 
I don't. Right. Anyhow, um, okay. I'm sorry. I keep interrupting. No. You. I, I just keep get. I, I get talking about this stuff. And I get excited about it. Oh, Gray Pilgrim's in. Howdy, Gray. No. So, uh, deliberate attempts were made to convert entirely to French muskets. But even by the war's end, some English muskets were still in use. Mm -hmm. English muskets continued to be used with the Continental Army after Yorktown. Um, yeah, and they're still in the arsenals uh, in the inventory. They have them called English muskets. And we talked about by the late 1790s, the U.S. Navy's like, we need brass mounted guns for the Marine Corps because these guns are lasting like a year at sea. <laughs> um so speaking of that late war sort of uh, consolidation, they would, this was a question I had is like, well, if I have a French musket and you have an English musket, uh, how is this done? Because they do uh, ammo supply at like a brigade level. So you have your own, you have your cartridge box, you mm -hmm. might have cartridges in your knapsack or your uh, haversack. And then they would have wagons with resupplies. So actually at the brigade, so like um it's you know you want to standardize as much as you can mm -hmm. initially this type of musket consolidation was at the company level level later becoming a regimental and then a divisional level and then thank thankfully we have all so much stuff about george washington online thanks to mm -hmm. national archives you can control f and go to the national archives and just see what he has to say about it yeah george washington directed brigade officers to report different calibers and the number of each kind of arm in their brigade and then the brigade and the, and the division and or the division would swap muskets. Caliber issues were evident in officer and quartermaster records leading to efforts to consolidate muskets of the same caliber within units. That makes and sense. Then, yeah. I mean, it all makes sense, right? It, it just, it just clicks. It yep. clicks. Like, why would you, you don't want to deal with the, the logistics tail if you can cut it down a little bit. Commanding or officers boys and, have brought their own guns. Yeah. <laughs> and walked off the and that's kind of funny because that's like at the end of the war. And George yeah. Washington for, at the beginning of the war is just like we are having issues with these, <laughs> these gauges. Um commanding officers were instructed to ensure compliance with the order and with brands available from the commissary of the military. So that is the war. And now I have the post-war, which I think I'll just keep going if you're fine with that. And just, Go ahead. Uh, I'll, yeah. I got some questions and stuff coming up here. I'll I'll let you finish up here, and then I'll uh, I'll get to them. Uh, okay. iPod Walker. Uh, iPod Walker was asking something. Uh, we'll we'll get to those in a little bit. I'll let uh, Revere 0311 finish up here. We'll just wrap it up so we can put it yep. in a box and put it away. Yep. So <laughs> post-war, the guns are turned in. Basically, the Army is disbanded. Um <clears throat> Everyone, George Washington resigns his commission. The war is over. We won. Awesome. Great for us. France, sorry, we're not going to pay that. <laughs> In 1794, Secretary of War Henry Knox advocates for the possession of 100,000 arms in the arsenal for national security. And what's happening in 1794? You know, why, why all of a sudden, like, hey, we need to start getting stuff. We need to start getting some guns. I wonder what's going to happen in 1795. Hmm. 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 Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, we have, we have a couple of reasons. We're going to have St. Clair's defeat, which was the greatest American loss to the Native American forces throughout all of American history. They should make a movie about that, I guess. And then France and Europe is going through revolutions and war. And America is just like, oh, we, uh, we probably can't import from France anymore as much as we used to if we yeah. needed to in a pinch. And also, uh, it's a new government, so we're not paying you. Um, April of 1790, <laughs> which is true. We told we're the broke. French. Yeah, we told the French, like, no, we made those that money we owed. That was to the king. That wasn't to this new rebel, Republican government. No, this... Hey, we give you the gift of liberty. <laughs> we'll get you back do in a couple the... world wars. Yeah, do with it what you will. In April 1794 was the first attempt by the United States to manufacture muskets domestically. And they're going to do it via contract. Secretary of War Henry Knox requests delivery of a French patterned musket to Tench Cox in 1795. He's the purveyor of public supplies. This is where I'm not, I'm not going to die on the hill. If you want to start changing naming nomenclatures, I think we should. It'd be good. But 
at the same time. Anyways, well, this is where Charlottesville I, I, comes I, from. That's what I was getting ready to say. This is where an actual Charlottesville is first referenced. Of if, anyone, if anyone can find a Revolutionary War era primary source, uh, I would like to see it because then I'm, I'm open to changing. But the uh, I just I can't find it. And I'm just interested. So if you can find Charlottesville being used, please send it to me. And I'll change and I'll walk it back. <laughs> the 7,000 muskets were to be modeled after the French arms is the actual the actual wording from the letter. Pickering uh, is your secretary of war at the time. Mm -hmm. So 1794, Congress gives George Washington the power to create two arsenals. You have Springfield Arsenal and Harper's Ferry. And let's, so how much, so in 1795, Springfield makes 245 muskets. How much do you think they're spending? to make an individual musket in 1795. I need Garrett in here for this one because we've talked about this while feeding cattle a while, a bit, and go ahead and tell me, and then I, I, okay. I got something to talk about well, on this. Well, the, the number is going to range, so $49.37. $49. So, so you're, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, just for contemporary concerns? They're making $49. It's hard to do the adjusting for inflation compared to the $12 in the revolution or the $5. For mm -hmm. But they do have the work, the worksmen, the men that work there, their pay. Then their pay, the most paid man was $26 a month. That's pretty yep. Um By 1796, they're making it for $14. By 1797, they're making it for $10.87. Mm -hmm. By 1798, they're making it for $21. <laughs> 1799 there was making that different $15. stamp you had to do for they had that different stamp. they had the one stamp. turn it sideways <laughs> so i'm not a springfield guy i'm i i just do french muskets and harper's ferry uh yep. harper's ferry is the other arsenal that's built uh it has to be built and it starts producing and there's one musket that's made in the year 1800 but it starts producing in 1801 yep. this is where we're going to get in the naming convention nomenclature we're just going to wrap it up with this timothy perkering uh pickering was the secretary of war he suggested that the charlottesville be adapted as the pattern of arm to be made at the national armories in december of 1795 the this charlottesville pattern the charlottesville pattern yep. these are more commonly known as uh on auctions and everything else as the model of 1795 these are actual charlottevilles these are the guns that were referred to as charlottevilles they're going to be made until 1816 for springfield and about 1819 for well actually through 1816 at harper's ferry mm -hmm. when they're making these guns they're just known as charlottevilles and then here's some more quotes on that. Such muskets are as manufactured after the model of the French arms, which comprise by far the greatest part of those in our magazines. For this reason, we have decided that these are the ones that are preferable known to the U.S. Um, we do not see we are seeing a supply was not to be expected from France for more French muskets. <laughs> the situation of the United States why. not rendering the measure. I don't know. What's let's things see, are let's, happening? I wonder what's going on in 1790. Five, Nine, five six, yeah. <laughs> an immediate You don't want those French muskets at that time period. <laughs> no, they're yeah, they're gonna blow up in your probably what mine is just a random piece of parts. So why the 1766? Not the most advanced musket. Um and but the US could duplicate the manufacturing of it, and they also had they could have the ability to duplicate a, a sufficient number of reliable Charlottesville patterns. Remember, they're trying to get to 100,000 guns and make them readily, readily available for a conflict. The first you're going to do is you're going to learn the art of manufacturing a musket, and we're going to learn the Charlottesville first, and then we will go on to improve the design. We talked about this earlier, so I'll just kind of... Uh, Decius Wadsworth says the oldest French musket he finds, that he knows of, is a 1746. 63, a 66, a 68. That one threw me for a loop because I need to go and correct that on my old video because it's been under my impression. What you read is that they don't refer to a 1768 as its own thing. The French don't. We know mm -hmm. that. So, But Americans are doing this by 1814. And then he also says uh, what they're principally of the old model. And he calls them the 1763. What he's really meaning is that 66 with the 68. 63-66. Yeah, yeah. 60. Or the 63 light. 
Yeah, yeah. He's, it's, well, he's passed away, so he can't bring him up to explain himself. <laughs> and he says name, and he says in 1814, known by the name commonly of the Charleville musket, mm -hmm. as a, which has served as a pattern of the United States that was intended to have followed the contracts of 1798, which involves your Henri Blanc, mm -hmm. Henri Blanc to Thomas Jefferson, to E. Whitney made the contract of 1798. But anyways, that's a different story. So uh, from this statement, the terminology of Charleville pattern was born and continued to use until the first American designed musket of 1815, which was very short lived, su supplanted by the 1816. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's that's basically it. There's contracts going on. They're trying to procure from Ketlin, like we talked about contracts. They're also setting up the national armories. But that concludes my rapid fire uh presentation on french muskets in the american revolution and the war of independence that's sorry if good. I speak like a machine gun no nope, uh, you're fine <laughs> you're fine that's pretty good uh yeah so i'm doing a like i said i'm doing a video on french muskets of the revolutionary war guns of revolution for this independence day i think we need to do a collaboration if I am around, I have a very crazy yeah. schedule. That is okay. Good. I'm okay. currently in a, I'm currently in a hotel room. Oh, this I know how that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I spent uh, like no. three months in a hotel room. <laughs> well, we got to get a couple things going because I have a Paul rifle that yes. I would like to uh, hand off. And then also we got to get you out east to do a reenactment. You know, you got to come out to one of the big ones, Brandy one, one of the thousand member ones. So, no, yep. I'm, uh, I haven't shot any of mine. Yes. I live in the suburbs. So I just look at them and read Furthest, about them. Furthest east I think I've ever been was I went to Portsmouth, New Hampshire one time. And that was on a flight going out to the Middle East. And I was well, laid got, over there for like two hours. And all I could think of was I was sitting here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And all I can think of is like, man. Lexington is not very far. <laughs> no, you're so close. Yorktown? I mean, yep. you got Yorktown where I'm at. Uh, Williamsburg, it's a it's a hoot. But no, we will definitely get we'll get it done. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I need to come out that way sometime. I was thinking about that uh, scene from Johnny Tremaine. They're trying to get information out of the British. I'm like, well, we could send this canteen up to you if we knew where you were going. Like, I don't think you're going to make deliveries to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. <laughs> But, uh, uh, okay, I'm going to get to, I had a few comments here. I was going to get to real quick. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Dixon wants to know, what unit do you portray? He's like, I much prefer my rifle as militia. The, dis this, the district I portray was noted for the use of the rifle. So I'm, I'm with the 7th Virginia. I obviously don't represent the 7th Virginia. All that disclaimer, I reenact the 7th Virginia. <laughs> uh blue and red is our uh it kind of like a middle colonies color you're gonna have all sorts of different uh regimental colors with different facings but yeah i'm with the seventh virginia and then is there a second part of that let's see here seventh virginia uh basically was taken out the cg charleston and those who survived were killed at <laughs> wax Hoss. It was basically some most of the Virginia line was completely knocked out at the siege of Charleston. So Tarleton was not your best friend. Then. No, so we were, <laughs> yeah. So we have to, we have to hate him, you know. It's just it's built in. So you know he the story. So you know the story about after Waxhaw right in the church in Tarleton. No, is it, are you say did burn the church? No, what? no, it didn't burn the church down. But he found some of the, I don't know if it was at Waxhaw or if it was right after that. He was chasing down some soldiers who had uh, escaped, uh, who had retreated, and they had fallen back into this church. And uh, Tarleton mm -hmm. rode up to the church, and he went and declared that anybody caught giving aid to the rebels was a traitor and would be sent to a prison ship. One of the guys that was lending aid was, I think he was eight years old, named Andrew Jackson. <laughs> really? <laughs> yep. Tarleton? And he got, oh, I didn't know that. Tarleton technically made Andrew Jackson <laughs> the guy he turned out to be. That's what the cool thing about the revolution is that so everything many ties names, together. Yeah, they're all like the people, like the 
Charles and Ty's face. Each, yeah, the regiments face each other. William Washington and Tarleton face each other a couple of times. Yeah, Tarleton ties into Washington. Simcoe. Yeah. Simcoe ties into Robert Robert. Robert Rogers. Yeah. Robert Rogers ties into uh, Johnny Stark. Uh, <laughs> you can war war of big personalities. It, that's what's interesting about it because it's so kind of small at the same time. Like you yep. can like, oh, this guy's Daniel Morgan. You know, he's yep. all the way up in Quebec, and then yeah. he comes down to <laughs> down like, Virginia. Yeah, or yeah. South Carolina, you know. Uh, and then it's like uh, the Battle of Kings Mountain, which is one of, I think is probably the most underrated battle of the revolution. Oh, yeah. I, I would say Kings Mountain and Cowpens working in tandem. Uh, well, were the, does it happen in the South? People yep. uh, there. Uh, mm -hmm. I've listened to Patrick O'Kelly had a good talk about this. I think it was yep. Patrick O'Kelly. Yep. He was saying it. that. Yeah, where it's like, well, they started writing the revolution at the centennial, which is 1876, which is close to the end of the Civil War. Civil War. So they just do Lexington, Concord, Bunker Hill, <laughs> Princeton, Yorktown. Let's be honest here. The <laughs> war did not go well in the North at all. No. <laughs> at all. No. Uh, didn't go well in the South for a while, but then that changed. Um, yeah, Kings Mountain's got to be like, Kings Mountain... The reason I say Kings Mountain is probably the battle that changed the wars because Kings Mountain, if it wasn't for Kings Mountain, uh, United States would not have won Cowpens because, yeah. uh, well, they might have, but if Ferguson could have gotten there how he was planning, um, Cornwallis could have joined up, would have been a completely different story. Uh, that and they had Tarleton running around all night thinking we're going to cross the river here. No, we're going to cross the river there. Yeah. Where are we going to cross the river at? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, iPod Walker wants to know what you know about the pattern. Seven iPod Walker is the guy that got me started on the pattern 1776 rifle. Okay. Like years ago. I don't, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm on, I'm on French muskets. I'm yep. just trying to get that. I know. Uh, I know a bit about the pattern 1776. A little bit. You're going to make a video about it. Yeah. Yep. Like I said, they've, uh, they've got it ready. I've just got to go get it. Um, uh yeah and i gotta build it and i gotta finish my model 1774 inspector general's musket first what was the name of that book you said that had all the french guns on, or english guns you i'm gonna you... pull it up here because i don't want to give you the wrong name it's dewitt bailey's uh i read through it here a couple years ago dewitt bailey's uh i think all it's... arms of the british forces in america uh hold a second no because it's it's about rifles yeah i think it's okay. the service rifle or the flintlock rifle um give me just a second here i've read so much about french muskets since then it's kind of all uh gone by the wayside uh somebody asked uh actually i'm gonna go back and while i'm looking for the yeah, name of this we can, yeah we don't you can just let me know later um no, right. somebody had asked you if you had read there's another book that I don't want to get the name wrong. It's uh, give me a second here. I'll find it. Um, somebody wanted to know if you had read Bob Thompson's revolutionary roads looks at several turning points that were a close, close things. New book, very informative and entertaining. That's from Dean Pingle. Revolutionary roads. I have not, but I will add it to my, my reading list. Yeah. Um, I've got a, this is going to bug me. Somebody's going to probably the answer it in the comments before I get there. Probably Gray Pilgrim. Uh, <laughs> Cause he's the, he's our book guy. Gray Pilgrim knows a lot about books. It's the best way to know anything. You have yep. to have a book. I believe it. I think it's, I can't, I don't have any signal here on my phone, but I think it's DeWitt Bailey's, uh, um, British rifles in the service, something like that. If you look up DeWitt Bailey's rifle book, it's you'll find it. It's actually okay. a really good book, and it's funny because I read his uh, uh, book. I see it. Yeah, British military rifles, seventeen forty to eighteen forty hardcover. DeWitt Bailey. Yep, yeah. that is an excellent book, and uh, okay. and um, it's funny because I read his, I read that one first. And it is a pretty good sized book and it's very detailed. And I mean, it's, I mean, it's not huge, but it's about that thick and 
you know, that tall. And I was like, well, now I got to read his book on the brown bess. And I did that for my brown bess video. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not kidding. That book was this tall <laughs> and this wide. And at the end of that little tiny book about the brown bess or the, you know, the land pattern muskets and all that, he puts in there, he goes, there were British rifles. And he just puts like a little bit on there. He's like, there were British rifles. I may need to do a, a, a small pamphlet pamphlet on British rifles in the service. And then you realize the next book that he comes out with is that giant <laughs> book on the rifle, extremely detailed. That's what uh, he made. So Schmidt, who writes U.S. Mill, he actually did a book on the hull first. Yeah. And this book is just... It's great. I've, you, I've told you about it plenty of times. So I was like, yeah. oh, I have a hull. I need a hull book. And they stopped producing it. So it's like $300 <laughs> online. I was like, man, I'm not going to make my mortgage at this rate. <laughs> well, I, was money... looking, I was looking over there and I had lost my Hathorn Waits uh, weapons and equipment of the Napoleonic Wars. And right before the live chat, I was over there. I was like, hey, there it is. <laughs> I've been looking for that. It's over at my brother's house over here. Uh so yeah, that that's a that's something. It's funny because you went down the path, and it's something I need to get to uh, the path of the French muskets in the Revolutionary War. And I got into French muskets because the American Revolutionary War. And then all of my books that I've got just kind of go over the Revolutionary War and then straight to the Napoleonic War. And I kind of got into that. Now that's a whole another rabbit hole. <laughs> so much history, so much to just. It's like a fire hose of information. Gray Pilgrim says he's just a dumb hillbilly. I'm like, nope. <laughs> Gray Pilgrim is Gray Pilgrim is the uh, the guy to go to for a lot of very good information. I, he's he suggested a few books to me that I got that were really good. Uh, let's see here. Um, no, somebody had asked. iPod Walker had asked. Uh, He had asked about if there were any captured pattern 1776 rifles or the Ferguson rifle. I don't know about the Ferguson rifle, but I know that there was at least one pattern 1776 that was captured and it was almost, it was in not very good shape. And I believe that was the one that the rifle shop got a hold of that they cast their pattern off of. Um, so. so Ferguson Ferguson has the rifles at Brandywine, but he doesn't have them at Kings Mountain. <sighs> I don't know if he has them at Kings Mountain or not. I would I don't assume think he, he would. But there, there's a reenactor that has a Ferguson, and he's like, the only event I can use it is Brandywine. Maybe he just doesn't go south to Kings Mountain. Maybe. But yeah, it's, uh, a, it's a crazy looking gun. <laughs> yeah, I've, I'm, I may or may not be having one of those on back order from the rifle shop, too. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be, I, I've got to build like six different rifle shop guns before I get to that one. <laughs> That's going to be a four. Like that was, I got that. The first one I started out with was a wheel lock pistol. Yeah. And I'd talk to the guy later on at the rifle shop and I, I messed that build up pretty, well, not pretty bad, but I messed it up a little bit and I ended up breaking the trigger, which the trigger on that is actually pretty complicated. And uh, I talked to him. He's like, how's that wheel lock pistol going? I'm like, uh, it's on hold for now. Cause that 1774 is way easier to build. He's like, yeah, I was thinking about telling you that the hardest lock, the hardest lock to build or the easiest lock to build is a musket lock because it's big and there's a lot of room for error. The harder locks to build are the pistol locks and the hardest lock of the pistol locks is a wheel lock pistol lock. He said, That's so you started down. off, you started off hard. Uh, but yeah, let's see here. Um, no, they sell go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. Uh, I think there were a few, maybe a handful of pattern 1776s uh, captured, but there, to be quite honest, there weren't a whole lot to begin with. Like I said, 800 yeah. of the uh, normal pattern 1776, and then 200 of the uh, Hanoverian pattern 1776. Um, let's see here. He had another question. Uh. So at the end of the war, what happened to the excess of British arms when they surrendered? Storage. They went into storage. So they went to the arsenals. And uh, I can actually tell you right now how many they had. <laughs> they had something like they were 
They did not have enough. Andrew Dixon says, he's like, I could be dead wrong. We'll see if he is. You got the book oh. there. He says, but as far as I know, the surrendered arms were, but as far as surrendered arms, they were in stores as far as I'm aware. Those in places like Charleston and New York City went back to Canada, best I can understand. Yeah, that's basically right. Yep. Springfield, West Point, but... Even though there are nearly 50,000 muskets in storage after the Revolutionary War, there are only 8,000 bayonets. Hmm. And uh, if, like, I'm going to just be doing this guy. He breaks it down to how many guns are in each place. So, Ethan, you got to get the book. I know. I've got a lot of books, and I need to add that yeah, one to my collection. But well, they go on this. So they go into storage, and actually, when they first start making the American Charlevilles, they, they pull parts. So that, that, that also builds in. So Joseph Perkins, he uh, works as a contractor repairing guns in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. He has experience with that, and he is the first superintendent of Harper's Ferry Arsenal. His, this is where the Joseph Perkins works. He fixes muskets. His initials are IP. These initials are stamped into the stocks of muskets that come from Philadelphia, but there's no concrete, everything you need, proof, proof, right? That says that he never signs a certificate that says, I use IP at, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's so, probably him, but yeah. But that brings up another thing Garrett had mentioned about uh, Henri Blanc and Springfield and Harper's Ferry. So the U.S. government had looked uh had been very had looked very seriously into whenever I say like Henri Blanc was set up to set or sent to set up two factories like Charleville and Saint Etienne. Yeah. Uh Harper's Ferry and Springfield. Um with that he was also supposed to set up the machinery for interchangeable parts like the French did until they looked at what the cost <laughs> was going to be for interchangeable parts. And that was what I thought was funny is I was talking with Gary. I was like, yeah, Louie liked to spend the money a yeah. lot. <laughs> and it kind of got him in the end. Yeah, he and, definitely uh, <laughs> kind of lost his head over the deal. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, there's Gary right now. But no, uh, speaking about, uh, we're talking about interchangeable parts at Springfield and why they didn't do it. I, I said I said it earlier. As soon as you say interchangeable parts, that's a whole rabbit hole. Have a, but, a thousand man, man here, power. He's here. I'll let him explain it to you. Go ahead, Garrett. Explain it. Well, if you've got two thousand men working at the factory that are skilled, you can pull it off. But you got to pay all those guys, or wait until machinery comes along. Yeah. Uh, you can make one hundred muskets that fit together pretty good, but machinery moves, gauges move, gauges get out of whack. And by the time you get to 200 muskets, maybe the 299th doesn't fit the first 10 and you don't have interchangeable parts anymore. Yep. The only way to do it is massive mm -hmm. spending and massive, massive, massive amounts of manpower. And there's one thing the United States doesn't do is spend money on guns. <laughs> hey, the whole rifle, right? That was expensive. <laughs> he says the whole rifle was expensive, right? Yeah. It took yeah. five years before he produced I don't know the first a lot about one. Rifles, but yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's interchangeable because it's Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry is a whole different ball game. Yeah. Springfield is just mass production. Put them out. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's so interesting that whole uh, just the, we need like a two hour just breakdown of the production. Do you know much about the assembly numbers on the inside of like Harper's Ferry is these assembly numbers? So the bottom of a barrel will have like seven. The inside of a stock will have seven. The tang of the bre the barrel will have a four. The screws will have fours. Yeah. So, so it's supposed to be matching. So when you put it together, I'm still trying to hunt that down. I'm pretty sure that's the same thing as like what the French daddy is talking about numbering of the parts on the Harper's Ferry gun. Just like that's pretty sure. Because like my AN9, when you look at that gun, every part inside of the lock has got the same number. Every part, you know, it's wow, like it's all, really? it's like it's a part of, uh, I think it has to do with the machine, if I remember right. 
or the inspector. Okay. It's either the inspector or the machine it was built on. Which is funny, though, because that Lehman rifle, it's got the same thing. Uh, it's got those numbers all over the place. Well, even Harper's Weird. Ferry didn't reach true interchangeability till late 1830s, early. Yeah. Because they built the Blanchard Mill out of cast iron. The, the Blanchard Lay. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't. Even the halls for what was interchangeable, I don't think literally every little screw was interchangeable, but I could be wrong. Yeah. I was just impressed with, like I said, with the 1779 and the AN9 and the 1774, how much of all those parts were actually interchangeable. You could do it. You just have to have a big mackerel. Yep. Which America did not have, and neither did France after... Uh, it's kind of like adopting a repeating <laughs> arm. Just all you got to do is bankrupt your country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that reminds me, I saw, and I know I need to cut the street, or you know, we'll go on for a little while longer, but I saw a comment on, uh, it was on Facebook, and it was somebody who couldn't understand why the British were so dumb as to not adopt the Ferguson rifle as the standard military arm. So the simple. War. <laughs> it's so simple. The war's already going on. You already yeah, have them, man. Just, You've made it before. Just make it again. Just make a several hundred thousand of these things, and you're just good to go. <laughs> yeah. They're having a hard enough Still time getting their... Instead of the machine. People don't take into account the amount of machinery that's required for no. such I think it was... Uh, yeah, I think it was... Um, uh, Mark Novak had said there was only two men in the world who could build that Ferguson breach system. Knock and uh, I can't remember who the other one was, but he's like Henry Knock was one of them. He said that was a that helical locking system. He said that was a that was a work of art. And another thing, a lot of people don't realize is the Ferguson was not the first military breach loading arm. Even for the British, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there was one that the military didn't officially adopt, but it was basically the same thing as the Ferguson. The only real difference was is you really had to, I think it was like 10 or 12, 10, 11, 12 turns you had to do to unscrew that breach. And then if you went too far, you could actually completely unscrew the breach. Uh, I'm sure Gray Pilgrim, I think he, I think he's talked about this before. But yeah, the Ferguson was basically a modification of that rifle. Yeah, because didn't he kind of poach the idea? From yeah, somebody? and it was actually a sporting arm. Uh, it was designed for hunters who were either prone or in a tree, so you didn't have to load. Um, you could load from the breech. Uh, <laughs> Soylent Green says, reel out a fish between each shot. Yep, that's probably what you could have yeah. done with that rifle. And I can't, let's see. Okay, Andrew Dixon's got something here. There was some conjecture, but may, but after the Battle of Brandywine and maybe Polly, but after the men went back and the rifles back into stores, it's documented that D. Paster had 1776 rifles for half his men. Hmm, there you go. See, I just, I've just read from it. From, I just know what I've read from DeWitt Bailey uh, talking about it. And uh, I don't really remember him saying what happened. I know that I, I don't remember what what Bailey said happened to 1776s after the war. But all I do know is what I've heard from uh, the rifle shop, and I'm pretty sure they said theirs was a captured uh, pattern 1776 that they went and uh, did that work off of. Which uh, also I got a hold of them the other day. I'm going to see. Uh, I asked them and they said they were interested. I'm going to send that. I think I'm going to send that pattern 1779 colonial troop musket into them. They're going to make castings off of it so people can get a uh, awesome a pattern 1779 colonial troop musket. Man, that's, those things are so cool. And those. it's just, you, I, you know, what's funny is, is I had commented on your YouTube video about that musket and I had not even seen that listing yet. Because I was like, man, I was reading about the 1779 Colonial Troop Musket, and I found this about what I think your mystery <laughs> musket is. And then it was like a week later, I found a Colonial Troop Musket. I love that. I mean, that mystery musket, when I do make it out, that thing's going to get shot, because that thing is fun. Of all the yep. ones that, yeah, yeah, the things that I'm convinced that that, uh, your mystery musket is a, uh, um, 
revolutionary era Belgian gun. I'm pretty convinced. And no, you're. I mean, you're, yeah, your arguments work. It's not. It's not a African trade gun. There was that, something. Yeah, no, because I have one of those, and they're uh, they don't even look. Like, yeah, the lock needed, is completely different. I did a guess this gun on a video on it, and I need to do an actual video on it because it's a uh, it's entertaining. Talking about the Belgian African trade musket. The, uh, the one that's sitting there. Right no, 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 that's British. The the A and nine we have at home. Uh, but um whenever you, you get a chance i was just going to mention a few things about when you were talking about the cost of the springfield mm -hmm. musket of charlottesville pattern yeah well in the first year of production they didn't have a uh, trans oh, can you hear what he's saying over here oh uh, they didn't have a, a trans what go ahead the first year of production springfield didn't have a transportation system from the water shops to the hill shops so they had to pack every single piece one mile each direction, pack it up, build it down at the water shops, pack it a mile up the hill, finish it, pack it a mile back down the hill to put it all together and do the file work. And as time went on, they got they got a better, uh, as the first few years went on, they got a better transportation system up and down the hill. And then they had a drought in the late 1700s that <laughs> cost them a lot more money because the river went low and they had to uh i think that one year that he said that it wound up costing 20 dollars again that was the year that, that was the year uh, they installed some okay. of the first steam shops because so they, the river was low so they had to use steam power there's why it cost it more they had a drought and they That's, had to yeah. build machinery for steam that is funny because Harper's Ferry kind of runs through like if the, you know, if the river the river's low. I don't remember which. Yeah, 1798. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, 1798. So it's $21 per. Yep. That was to pay for machinery, evidently, because of a drought. That's Those why I are... like having Garrett around. Yeah, that's that's some great <laughs> stuff. Uh, well, it's just crazy when you compare them. Obviously, it's a different place, different time. But like build France a, is just like so far. a mile from the river. Yeah. <laughs> Garrett says, who would build a factory a mile from the river? <laughs> Evidently, Springfield. Henri Blanc probably had something to do with that. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, iPod Walker said Ferguson improved the breech screw, so one turn would do not the 10. Yep. And uh, like I also said, they had issues with, memory serves me right, they had issues with if you accidentally went too far, it wouldn't stop. And you can actually unscrew the entire breech, and then you're sitting there trying to thread your breech back into place. Um, not a captive system. Uh, Gray Pilgrim says the whole Connecticut Valley was full of gunsmiths, which is why all their families were intermarried. The river turned. The river turned a lot of water mills. Yep. Um, yeah. So anyhow, we're getting close to two and three quarters of an hour here. We'll probably run till. Two hours and 45 minutes. Probably run for another couple minutes here. You guys ain't got any more questions real quick? Go ahead and throw them out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Soylent Green says that Revero 311 made, made me buy the Muskets of the Revolution Ahern book. <laughs> so I'm here I for I haven't gotten it. <laughs> like I said, yeah. I, I went... And I was going to go to American War of Independence, and then something happened, and I went right top by it and into Napoleonic War, which I just found I got Are way, you, way you deeper. Want them all. Yeah, I got way deeper into the Napoleonic War than I ever planned to. So I just picked up in the last week a Hull and a Charleville Type 2, and I have a Charleville Type 3 video coming out this weekend. So it's been a very expensive couple weeks but yeah. i got a type two and a type three so it's been all charlottesville all the time harper's ferry and yeah i wish the only thing i wish they would just like hey can you take the the lock off so i can see inside i want to look at the markings <laughs> but auction house will go do that yeah nope they don't uh that was uh i think you saw that a and nine video when we took that gun or garrett took that gun apart yeah, and the scarf joint that they did over there underneath the that barrel band. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. if it's broken, that was some beautiful work done on that gun. 
so I have this uh, this type three has a split stock. So I'm, and I didn't even notice it until a few hours into messing around with it. So I'm kind of curious. It's walnut, and ha the the it's from the lowest barrel band forward. Mm -hmm. Um, but the stock has the assembly number that matches the barrel. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the middle barrel the middle barrel band and the front barrel band cap with the front side post, whatever, those are, those are new mm -hmm. and then the stock's new. So I'm kind of curious what your thoughts, if you think it's an, I think it's an Arsenal rebuild, but you know, man, like, I don't know. Which one's that on? That's a American Charleville type three made 1816. So I have that video I'm releasing this weekend. We'll have Garrett, Garrett will watch it. He'll know. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm curious. Yeah. There was a question, though, I had about your mystery musket, and I don't know if I asked it yet or not. So the flats on the breech, does it have the five flats, or does it have the two? I think, it's just, two. I think it's just two. Off so, yeah. if you got just two flats, you've actually got, I would definitely say you're probably safe to shoot. Because that's okay. pre-1784, uh, 1777 musket. Okay. 1784, they went to five flats, and it's uh you were talking about why the united states we'll go we'll go for just a little bit longer here and then i'll let you go but talking about the united states why they went with a 1766 uh reading wise what i can find out is like Bian bianchi claims that the 1766 lock was the most i think it was bianchi who claimed it was the most reliable of all of the french locks and possibly possibly one of the most reliable locks ever made um, and then it's like the 1777, which comes afterwards, the pre-revolutionary era, 1777 is he, he claims he, well, he says people claim he takes neither side, but he says the pre 17 or the pre-revolutionary era, 1777 is the greatest military flintlock possibly yeah. ever made. And he's like the revolutionary era war, uh, hit or miss. And then he says, and then the A and 9 is just like a step under the 77. But anyhow, what all that <laughs> boils into is, uh, I think the Americans, another reason, and it may not have even, nobody may have mentioned it, but I think they probably fell in love with that reliability of that lock, if I was to guess. Yeah. They so I gotta, have it. yeah. Do, you remember, do you remember how many rounds it was before they had had a misfire, they they did in that test. I can't remember the number off the top I of my can't head. Off the top of the head, it's yeah. a lot. Um, it was a lot, but yeah. But everyone loves the brown best. We'll just we'll bring it full circle. Yeah. yeah. Until until ten years ago, it was just brown besses here, brown besses there. Yeah, the Americans no, used actually, brown besses and Kentucky long rifles. Yeah, no, it's all <laughs> about once you've had the privilege of having bands and you mm -hmm. can take your barrel off your stock you will never not uh, i hate the pin system Me it's, too. It's, and they're like well uh, it's designed like that it's like well it's poor design it's <laughs> poor design you should, you should let your men take the stock off so they can clean <laughs> so the, they can uh, clean their weapon yeah so they can clean their weapon like i don't know uh let's see here Oh, we got a comment. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, it's kind of winding down. Uh, Gray Pilgrim says he has a brown best. Yep, I've got a they're couple. Good. I mean, they they're fun. They are fun. Musket. Sorry, they are. I have one too. Like I have it. I like it. Like it's I, if I can purchase an original one, I will. I just I got three. You have and, three, yeah, and you have an original one too. You have one that was uh, actually, yeah. yeah, it's sitting right over there. I just can't touch it because uh, yeah. it's getting this stock rebuilt by Garrett. But yeah, it's a, it's a. I believe I used to think it was a long land pattern. I don't really know why, but it's actually an India pattern uh, that's been converted over to percussion lock. Um, but yeah, I've got three, and I will always, even though, and I think we'll end it up with this right here. Um, ask you a question, but. Uh, I've always had, I will always have a soft spot in my heart for the Brown Bess because it was the first flintlock I ever shot, the long land pattern, an Indian made military heritage, Bombay pipe bomb, you know, whatever people like to call them. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> that long land pattern will always hold a special place in my heart. But the minute I got my hands on, even if it was the Indian made 1768, that's not historically accurate from the box. Uh, I fell in love. It's, yeah, so that, it's, it's a game changer. <laughs> yeah. And that brings, that brings us around. And the first place I ever heard of the Charleville was actually where the French muskets in the American war of independence was a book I'd read a long time ago, a history book. And I thought that was interesting because all I'd heard about really was Brown best this Brown best that. And that brings us to the question. Revero 311, before we call it a night, where was the first place? We're going to make this two questions. Where was the first place you ever heard of the French muskets or the Charleville in particular in the American War being used in the American War of Independence or just heard of it in general? And which is your favorite pattern of French musket? Go. First, first I heard of it. Well, I played battle, Battlegrounds back in the early 2000s, so I must have played it with the Charleville. But I mean, I'm pretty recent to the flintlock experience it's what, it is an experience yeah, it is so i guess uh reenacting what uh, year did you get you know, started 2021 so oh so you got it. started a year after me yeah I so, 2020. And then, I, I mean this kind of why i've even made a channel because there's nothing online there's nothing nope. on youtube and i was looking around like so i bought this harper's ferry conversion model 1816 knew nothing about it went to youtube and there's nothing and i was like and what, what there is is not right <laughs> yeah and what <laughs> there is is not right so i was like so i started making these videos the my first videos that's why they're not edited they're for my buddy that works at the museum because mm -hmm. i wanted to show him my auction win and then some people watched them so and, and then, so it's just kind of been like, and then been following you and you completely changed the whole game on like the India pipe bomb stuff. And when you <laughs> proof that barrel, it's still one of my favorite videos, not to fan, fangirl too hard, but like, no, and then the thing you've done a great job of bringing up the, just the common sense application from like a, the standpoint of having barrel bands. There's a reason everybody else goes mm -hmm. with barrel bands. Uh, my favorite gun is gotta be a 1766 with the improvements because that's what I have. So <laughs> I spent the spent the time, yep. the time and the time and the time to make sure I got it right. And uh, so that one, you know, I just love them. They're so light. My original is eight, eight and a half pounds. It's a good I guess good. My, mine's not my too far off then. <laughs> yeah. What is your 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 Charleville 68 veteran arms now way? Uh, so I think it's like eight pounds and six ounces. Okay, it's great. Light. Yeah. It's light. Yeah. It's very light. Because an actual, it's like ten pounds out of the box, and that's what I hate. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I want, and I saw it's you shaded down. All right, yeah. So no, it's been anything French infantry muskets, and uh, this has been. Thank you so much for having me on. You actually really pushed me to get my notes together because I've had thirty <laughs> pages of random stuff. I'm like, oh, I need to get this in a more but, concise well you're doing better than me because you're sitting here and it's funny because you start talking about this stuff and whenever i do a video i'll study up on it and then i kind of brain dump a lot of the stuff you know afterwards you know you'll have it when you're making the video and it's just in your head yeah. i don't use i don't use teleprompters sometimes i'll have notes sometimes i'll have my book sitting there with me but usually whenever i'm done with the video i'll move on to my next one and then all that stuff kind of goes by the wayside so i'm just sitting here listening to you and i'm like yep yep Okay, and then it's like, oh yeah, I remember reading this. Now. <laughs> it's like it's coming back to me slowly but surely. <laughs> we're we're looking at the same sources, so I'm just pulling it from sources. I'm not, yeah. So we're. Oh, the, yeah. Andrew Dixon said he was at Gilliford with you. I know he's a good boy of mine. He's a good friend. <laughs> we're gonna. <laughs> Some about a three pounder. Yeah, yeah. I think he killed me. He killed me out there. Oh, did he? I yeah, he. Uh, Andrew Dixon actually was the one that. He knows what's coming with this Charlottesville this weekend. I messed up. I made a mistake on the buy, but you know, there's always yeah. it happens. I need to get it's, me a three a three pounder for Brigan gun. Yeah. I got to get a wall gun. I got to get my wall gun in and built first. It seems like you you got a lot of guns to fix, and then you're gonna have a hall <laughs> rifle to fix here, right? Shortly. So I've got. I'm gonna think of this off the top of my head. 1774. Uh, paddle butt wheel lock carbine, uh, two AKs because I do that kind of as a side hobby. Uh, 
I got a uh, paddle up wheel lock. I got a snap haunts, a Dutch wheel lock Fowler, a wall gun, a Ferguson, a pattern 1776. Um, <laughs> let's see. What else am I working on here? Uh, I'm probably going to do more work on old Char eventually. Uh, Garrett's doing something. He's doing that brown bus in there. Uh, he's fixing the stock on it, and I gotta look around here. Oh, and I gotta fix a spring for a mole rifle. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and my Willock pistol that I'm putting on hold right now because it's makes me sad when I think about it. <laughs> but anyhow, for days, man. Looking forward to it. Well, anyhow, guys, it's getting pretty late, so I think we'll call it a night here. All right. So. As always, guys, thank you for watching. Trust in God and keep your powder dry. Bye.